Hello and welcome to the third episode of our Tier List and Factual Analysis series. Today I'm again joined by Grotnip. Hello everybody and welcome to Yearcast, the Tier List. Yeah, so this is going to be our final episode where we are going to go through uh, the rest of the factions, so Combined Army, Aleph, O12, Toha and the non-aligned armies. First, today we have the Combined Army. So I guess there's a lot to talk about in Combined Army. Where, where do you want to start? Um, I think it's quite okay to start from the fact that they are pretty much the whole package. Yeah, so maybe we can go through all the individual or the most important individual pieces that make up the whole package. So I guess a good place to start is the most oppressive uh, GML combo in the game currently. Uh, anathematic and beat and kiss where you can get pictures quite reliably almost anywhere in the table and then you have hidden deployment or at least camouflage with 16 hacker with also trinity plus one burst and not only a hacker that's ex exceptionally capable at the job of info war, but also a hacker that packs a plasma weapon and, and that is uh, quite fast moving and extremely dangerous as a gunfighter uh, and, and a high willpower specialist for specialist functions. So, so there's pretty much everything there that you could want from a model of yeah. this type. Yeah, Anathematic already by itself is almost the whole package. And also has two wounds and no wound incapacitation, so it's really difficult to kill with Mimetism minus six. And also on top of that, they also have other good hackers like Dartok that you can also add to the list if you need even more hacking. But yeah, Anathematic can kill enemy hackers easily and because of its wounds, it, it doesn't really care if, if, if you Trinity him back. It's the best spotlight in the game. So that is a combination that sometimes can already by itself win the game on turn one. And then when we look beyond that, um, in uh, in some other faction we could discuss how uh, an element like this has to carry the faction because the support is lacking. Well, that's not truly the case here because the support available and the rest of the pieces available to a combined army list are so tremendous. When you look at the humble supporting pieces uh, like the warbands and the package bots, they are uh, some of the best, if not the best in the game. Datorazzi are amazing warbands with their mimetism, their uh, high physique, their berserk, their excellent close combat skills. Uh, they they give you access to impetuous smoke throwers that can then throw smoke for your MSV, uh, currented if if you want to do that. Um, the Icatrons are are not only uh, package bots but they are fast moving package bots on a smaller basis than what you usually find. They come equipped with repeaters, flamethrowers with extra burst and repeaters. So I know, <laughs> what, also what else could pulse. you want? Yeah, yeah, I think Icadrons are models that are not talked about often, but they are probably the best cheerleaders in the game, I think, because of the reasons you mentioned. They have those flamethrowers, they have baggage. They are still a two only, but they're fast. They have flash pulses, and you can even like fix them quite easily. Do they have remote presence, by the way? I think they should. Let me just quickly check. Yeah, they have remote presence. Yeah, of course. <laughs> why? Why wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah. And they also have not only they have armor one, but they also have BTS six, which is pretty nice. Yeah. So if you shoot them with breaker weapons or viral weapons, they can actually survive. Even when or they, get or they can shrug off a hacking attack uh, that's not spotlight uh, yeah. in, in some situations. Uh, don't Please don't consider what the Icadron gets over more traditional package bots for a single point that it's more expensive than they are or you are driving yourself crazy. Yeah, and that's a good, good example of a model that's not like overpowered in a way that you can't win a game because of Icadrons, but they are just so under-costed compared to other baggage spots. Yeah, they are extremely difficult to take out in a points efficient manner. 
and and in combined army uh, it's easy to feel when you're facing them that you are having to fight out fight so many over performing models that aren't breaking the game in and off of themselves but they when when you stack enough of those together it just feels like an uphill battle all the way through yeah and then we may continue with warbands uh they have of course taigas which uh are not the best warbands in the game but they are really useful in combined army because they're great at protecting expensive units with their uh good dodges and six cents and also they have the four point gawkies to give some extra flexibility to your list building uh they also have ava2 flash pulse bots unlike many other vanilla factions and they have imatrons as well so you can get lots of cheap orders uh then they have two great tags avatar and sphinx and in general they have a lot of good models that you can pick your flavor to your list yep. so you already mentioned charon did they have shesky and raicho norkias uh speculo and grief for impersonators also noctifer and rossiat and even though like noctifer or rossiat are not the best models in the game by themselves the uh, the fact that they have access to both is really useful because when you see a combined army list that has only 14 troops, you don't know whether there is a Rossiat or Noctifer, or it could be also Malignus, but like you have to be prepared for both Noctifer and Rossiat, and that makes the like the game really like cognitively taxing because there's so many other things that you have to consider. Exactly. And they, they still have access to uh, Libertos, uh, Calibans are pretty great. Uh, Dr. Worm is at the same time a doctor and an engineer, which means that it's a one-stop shop. Uh, you only need to sacrifice a single troop slot and pay a midi media core amount of points and you get both engineering and doctoring support to your force. Uh, and when a combined force um, includes several remote presence models, that means that it's quite reliable. Uh, rely, uh, it's, it's quite often the case that the enemy is unable to take your models all the way to dead, and then you can revive them using the rerolls if necessary. So that also gives them some, some uh, staying power that other factions may lack in the same situation. Uh, and the combined army factions also benefit from a TR bot, a total reaction bot, that has mimetism, and that's quite quite an upgrade. Yeah, I think it describes the vanilla combined army pretty well. They have the best TR bot in the game, but you don't see it often in combined army lists because there's just so many other things that are even better. And and also, yeah, you mentioned Calibans, but in general, they have good selection of like camouflage infiltrating models or, well, Calibans are not infiltrators, but still forward deployment plus eight inches, I think. So they are almost like infiltrators. And they have motorized bounty hunters because why not sure get everything. They have access to um, extremely good uh, MSV unit in in the current it uh, and they even have some depth when it comes to msv units if you need feel like you need it and also if and when the combined army list is running a uh, aspect lieutenant that is a current it or or some other variation of of the um what's the skill called Mem memonica units it's almost like you have a universal chain of command in your list because the only way basically to take out the lieutenant for good is to isolate them. Uh, if you don't isolate the combined army lieutenant that has Menonica, it's able to then, when you kill it, jump into a different model with its willpower and the lieutenant ability. So they are extremely resistant to loss of lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So overall, one of the combined army has almost everything you want in a faction and a bit more. So are we talking about S tier? Yeah, we're clearly talking S tier here. Uh, only question is above or behind or above or below um, nomads. Uh, yeah, we didn't really talk about the weaknesses of combined army. And of course there are not many weaknesses, but 
Yeah, I, I, I'm, I <laughs> I'm inclined to say we already did. There aren't any. Yeah, I think the like the only maybe way, major weakness in Vanilla Combine Army is that they usually their lists have like a couple of uh, expensive, really good models, and they kind of have to carry the list on their shoulders. Although they get great support, but it's still those couple of models like maybe Anathematic or and Charlie or Sheskin. And if you're somehow able to neutralize them or are able to kill the orders from the list, uh, then they start to struggle. But also, like you mentioned before, like getting rid of those orders from combined army can be more difficult uh, than you than you think, because a lot of them have remote presence, and uh, tigers are great at dodging. Uh, so you are likely to waste some orders when you're trying to shoot stuff down. Yeah, just like you pointed out, I, I also feel that the so-called standard uh, vanilla CA aspect list is is quite top heavy. So there is, you can either uh, outfight them by, by targeting and, and successfully taking out the big hitters or by starving them of orders, but both are difficult to do, especially against a, an excellent CA player. And also, I would like to raise here the point that you mentioned when we were talking about the Vanilla Nomads, that even though the so-called standard cookie cutter list is extremely powerful, there is plenty of depth behind that that could be harnessed uh, harnessed into making a, another list that's uh, also scary, if not exactly as effective um, as, as the so-called standard list. Uh, Combined Army has taken a hit of late in this regard when the uh, avatar uh, archetype of a list was nerfed to a point that people don't seem to be that willing to use it anymore. But I also feel that there is a possibility of building different kinds of vanilla Combined Army lists that would not be as top heavy and that would be still quite scary. So that also is a definite strength of the faction, I feel. Yeah. And even with those top heavy factions, like you can run one top heavy list in a tournament, even an avatar list, although that list isn't as good as it was before. And still in some matchup, you can just put avatar on a table and there is not much your opponent can do to the avatar. And then against some other factions, you play your other list. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I would say they are still ahead of nomads, although maybe not by much, but I, I would say they are the best faction in the game yeah yeah I, I i would agree agree to that yeah it, it would be kind of nice to have a more controversial or more of a hot take view on this but we have to call it what it is i think combined army is the best faction in the game yeah and and also um i feel that they are more um, more likely to achieve good results um, in many games in a row than than no, the uh, archetypical nomad list, maybe for example. And also we have put QK at the top of B so far, so I think our our quota of of uh, picks that make people <laughs> raise their eyebrows is already uh, so far quite well well and fully uh, stocked up. Yeah, it's good that we have QK there. So next we have Morats. Uh, they're probably the faction that benefited the most from the fire team update and has had like the best uh, faction revision that has come out of late. Yeah, for sure. Although the jury is still out on Pak uh observance side of things, but yeah. Uh, by virtue of almost everyone else losing their powerful uh, so-called pure fire team bonuses, the fact that uh, the Morats are able to field uh, pretty much everyone together and form pure fire teams to their heart's content makes them extremely powerful in, in what they primarily want to do, which is tra tra uh, travel forward <laughs> slowly and shoot things uh, to little pieces, and they're exceptional at that. Yeah, yeah, they have the best or the second best links in the game, I think, with all the different options that they can put in a pure core link. 
And I think the like most important piece usually in that link is the Syriat HRL, which is, if not the best, one of the best arrow models in the game. Having MSV HRL armor four with AP immunity, BTS six, and also a tin bot. Yeah, I uh, I agree. The Syriat HRL HRL is the guy to go to, and even if you're b building a fire team that's primarily made out of lighter elements, that's the heavy infantry element you usually at least want to include. Um, I really don't like the design of of, uh, of the Suryat HRL because it's a one-stop shop that gets you basically everything and by virtue of being that it knocks all the competition off the table pretty quickly. You can obviously uh, pick some other MSV options that have for example longer range. Um, uh, there is the potential for example yeah yeah there's also yeah potentially more stopping power there but uh, none of those units gets you everything that the suriat gets uh, and it's the type of unit that's very uh, un, un, unfun for the opponent to engage uh, because the chance of catastrophic failure is always there when it's in a full fire team you can't uh, surprise attack it you can't use mimetism against it, so it's basically trying to outrange it with, with something and then hope that you don't get unlucky. But at the same time, it's a piece that can take hits and survive. So, so it's it's bit bit tough to face. And and um, when the Morats get to play with their strengths and the opponent is struggling to find the means to answer i feel that they can be quite a negative play experience for for not so um experienced players because they feel like there's nothing they can do to um, engage and defeat uh, these guys yeah it's hard to engage surya at hrl in a way that the odds are heavily in your favor and also it's quite resistant against uh, any hacking game being a veteran having that tin bot at the same time, while I was thinking when the Morats in their current form came out that the CB might have gone too far with them, at the same time they are quite a restricted sectorial in that they struggle to be very diverse in their uh, threat projection and the way they play. Uh, they uh, their midfield presence is is pretty weak. They lack hidden deployment models altogether. So if there's a model missing, you know it's uh, probably a drop trooper of some type, or then they just ran out of, out of points. But probably a drop drop trooper of some type is is waiting on the wings. Uh, and usually the Morats have to move forward and engage, move forward and engage, and that makes them pretty predictable in how they behave. And that makes uh, countering them a whole lot easier. And f at least for me personally, when I think of the concept of, of the Morad aggression forces, for some reason I get the feeling that these are the alien warrior elite and you don't want to get close to them because they are so overpowerful, uh, overpowerful in, in, in close ranges, but that's actually not the case. When you get close to Morats and, and you fork them with templates, they usually break apart pretty soon. So so getting shotgun armed models, getting um, Carmen and Bathard when playing RTF, for example, close to them usually gets them pretty quickly. So so they have their weaknesses there. Yeah, they aren't very good in CC either. So they are actually are surprisingly vulnerable at close ranges. The that Rossi are of course great at, at CC, but in general they are best at like middle ranges or middle to long ranges. But yeah, uh, yeah, like you said, I think the major weakness of Morat is that they are a very straightforward brute force faction uh, that is also slow. So most of their models start in their own deployment zone and have only four four movement. So that makes them very predictable and and if you are able to play against them well they usually don't get that many targets to attack uh, they of course have some models that are really dangerous like up close like the chain rifle uh, kaitok yeah but at the same time that's a model that's quite easy to stop with traditional heavy infantry counters like hacking it's a bts bts3 model 
So even if it's in a fire team with a tin bot, it can uh, struggle to uh, survive hacking attacks. And it's also a model that risks, uh, due to its higher first movement value, it risks out, outstripping the rest of the force that, or the rest of the fire team that's accompanying it. So it's not that easy to utilize um, at, at close ranges either. Uh, and it, and from what I have seen so far, most Morat players don't seem to be packing uh, the guided missile platform, even though Dartox are amazing hackers and um, they, Morats have access to two of them. Um, that's something that I feel Morat players could maybe use to diversify their attack vectors. Obviously, that means that then they're uh, straight shooting is gets gets uh, dinged because they don't have the SWC for for um, more big guns. But uh, like you said, if an opponent is able to starve them of long range targets and draw them up close, then then the Morads can be uh, in a, tr a troublesome situation in that case. Yeah, and also the fact that they usually move in links, usually a five man link or at least a three-man Harris, means that their models are grouped quite close together, and then when you can get some template weapons there, uh, they can start to die quite quickly, even if they have two wounds and, and pretty good armor. Sometimes they will just outperform out, uh, the attacker, but yeah, they are, so often they're going to, going to start going down. And they're also a faction that gets two Harrises, and uh, many Morat players choose to feel that. But when you have two three-person Harrises and a five-man five core, which is something that the Morats usually want to do because of their full fire team bonuses, that means that you are basically tying up 11 out of your 15 models into three tactical elements, which uh, highlights or, or, or emphasizes the fact that they are so so uh, easy to predict and, and they have um, only so many ways of engaging and, and that makes playing them quite reasonable. So where are we going to place them then? I think they probably still belong to A tier and I just want to, before that I want to highlight, I think you made a really good point about Darthok and the GML play. I think I totally agree that not including a dart and a missile bot is probably going to be a mistake often in the more at least although then you get access to only two big guns in the list but having that versatility in your attack options is great because that data also has picture and you get a pure link so you can actually fire those pictures quite reliably and if i'm not mistaken they also get eka drones yeah sure and especially in, in some games, if your opponent is not giving you any targets, you, you of course, you can run your Daturasi Harris there, but it also takes quite, a lot, quite many orders to run your Daturasis from your deployment zone to the enemy deployment zone. Exactly, and they are quite uh, a valuable tactical asset to use in such a way. So And, and they can also be defended off uh, with the traditional warband counters. Uh, I also tend to feel that the Morat scenario play is a bit weak because of the aforementioned fact that they tend to move in groups and the amount of tactical um, elements they are fielding is a bit lackluster. So I think I would also ding their, their tier list position based on that. So I'd be willing to put them in B tier. How, uh, how, how strongly do you feel that they belong in A? I would put them in the bottom of A tier. And I think also Morat is one of those factions that not many good players have yet played a lot with. I think there is more in Morats, more potentially in Morats than we have currently seen. So I would, okay, I would I can, place them I, behind Yu Ching. Yeah, I can, I can live with that. That might not be my first choice, but uh, we are getting into a grouping of factions here that the... Um, distance between them is quite small they're they're quite tightly packed into power level so i'm fine with that so next we have shaswasti this is a faction that often gets compared to vanilla combined army and in that comparison they look really weak because they have access to only about one third of the units um, and the reason why they get compared to vanilla 
uh, combined army is that their links are relatively weak compared to other sectorials. But I don't think Shaswasti is a bad faction. Uh, I right? totally totally agree. So first of all, they have an excellent camo game. They have good choice of different kind of options that can be under camouflage, and like getting rid of those camouflage, even with the uh, Tachimoto uh, rules of this season, is often quite difficult. I think the like the only weakness in their common game is that they don't have any like big weapons under camouflage uh, except Noctifer, but Noctifer is usually in hidden deployment. Well, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Kaliban does have a multispectral visor spitfire option and I feel that qualifies as a big gun in, in what we are talking here. Yeah, and also, yeah, yeah, and also Jaswasti is one of those factions that's able to mimic the effectiveness of uh, heavy weapons by employing other types of attacks. So I, I wouldn't um, wouldn't make uh, too, uh, too much of a point about them lacking heavy weapons in that regard. Uh, yeah, for active turn, sure, Caliban's uh, Spitfire is... A strong weapon but it's not a weapon that you want to reveal in an arrow to surprise yeah, your yeah, opponent for sure. uh but yeah you make a good point about the like other ways they can use their camos to kind of like have pseudo heavy weapons like using forward observing shrouded or even the hackers to spotlight enemy models and then fire missiles and they can also uh, put missiles uh in their link teams with nox troopers that count as pure fire teams yeah, um, I'm actually starting to warm up to the Nox fire team composition thing because being able to put your your missile bot there, um, you're able to field quite affordable hack Nox hackers in that fire team. Also, uh, they get Ida uh, Swanson, who I think counts as a Nox. Uh, so, so the Nox core isn't as bad as at least I have thought of before so there is something there i feel yeah the nox are not the best shooters obviously but they can like build a quite useful and versatile core team still and of course they have the sphinx which is a great tag the only like downside of sphinx is that it has only speed fire so it is not great against targets with heavy armor but for that you have other tools and if you're playing a faction or against a faction where you might expect uh, units with a lot of armor, like a tag, you can use another list that doesn't have a Sphinx. And the Sphinx also, I feel, suffers here from the fact that it's a BTS-6 tag um, that's operating in a faction that traditionally doesn't um, establish hacking superiority, at least early in the game. So it has to dance around repeaters and other uh, hacking defensive, so, uh, like anti-attack uh, hacking solutions. So that somewhat restricts what the uh, Sphinx can do here. Yeah. yeah, I think Sphinx is something that is really good in, in some matchups, but not that useful or at least quite vulnerable in some other matchups. Uh, they, of course, they have Shed Skin as well, that also can be linked if you want. Although the link options for Sheskin are not that great. I mean, it's a wild card, but it kind of form pure fire teams with anything. Then they have Speculos, and they have the their special Mine Layer Speculo. Although it got nerfed in the latest rule update, because now you cannot place or use a Mine Layer skill to place a mine in the trigger area of enemy models. Which kind yeah, of I sucks feel that, for Shaswasti. That's quite a big hit on them because that was one of the alpha strike vectors for Shashvasti to use that mine as an offensive tool. And also when not employed as such, it was still a thing that the opponent had to be wary of. And now now they don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, especially when they can get two speculos in the list. And tragically, speculo killers are the only smoke uh, carrying models in the faction. So even though the abundance of camouflage models means that the Shashvastis can move around the battlefield, 
quite easily without the use of smoke. There are situations where you would want to have that smoke anyway, and it's locked behind quite a high pay paywall, and also it's uh, equipped on a model that you usually want to be using quite aggressively and quite actively on the in the offensive sense, and thus it's not usually there to support other guys coming behind. Uh... Where would you place Shaswasti, or is there something you still want to add about the faction? Uh, well, the one thing I would like to add, or, or a couple of things, is the fact that first they get uh, AVA2 TR bots, um, which is quite powerful, considering that they have access to the said mimetic, mimetic uh, TR bots, and with their traditional lack of long-range heavy weapons, that's something that they can use more freely. Than, than some other types of um, combined army factions may be able to do. Um, and also, I have a feeling about the sh Shaswasti a bit like with Rama, that uh, they are a group of models that when you band them together, there is some synergy there that you don't get by using a few of them alongside a vanilla force. So I feel that the Shaswasti uh, do have a distinct playstyle and they do have some strengths that uh, come from fielding mostly Shaswasti troops. So I think they are better than their reputation in some circles is, but at the same time I have seen some people rate them extremely highly and I would not be placing them in A tier for example. Yeah, yeah, there are one obvious weakness is that the whole just was the army or the list consists mostly out of uh, one wound models. So it's also a fact that it's pretty difficult to play well. And also it's not that resistant against bad luck because of that fact. Uh, I would probably place them uh, somewhere in the bottom half of B tier. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Um, above Tunguska, maybe? I think somewhere close to Tanguska. I was thinking about maybe uh, between Tanguska and Caledonia, but I think it's a pretty close call. Yeah, I can live with that. Let's say they're in the Tunguska area and let's place them there. It could be there or maybe above Tunguska, but yeah. Yeah, they're totally different faction, obviously, from Tanguska yeah, or, yeah, yeah, or Caledonia. Sure. And I think Shastwasti is also one of these factions that could have more potential if they are like really studied and played well. But yeah, I... they feel like a faction that, that uh, many people start when they uh, buy the models because uh, the combined army action pack is Shaswasti starter basically, but many people then seem to gravitate towards playing vanilla instead of sticking with the Shaswasti, so there might still be a lot there to be discovered. Yeah. Then next we have Onyx, which uh, interestingly enough is the other faction that got relatively big nerf in the latest rule update when they clarified the uh, bioimmunity rule. So now AP and K1 weapons works against uh, Xeodrons. Yeah, that was a big hit on this faction. Uh, CB seems to have some kind of hate-love relationship with these guys because they they improve them and then they make them worse. <laughs> and let's see what happens, happens now. Uh, people widely didn't think highly of Onyx at the beginning of N4. Uh, they are a faction that lacks many of the excellent things that uh, the combined army Vanilla gets. Um, starting from such simple things as smoke and, and basically warbands altogether. Um, but with the addition of the NCO uh, Nexus engineer, um, the extremely tanky double Xeodron um, Nexus engineer NCO Vulcan shotgun uh, fire team became more or less the faction's calling card, at least um, in in the minds of people. But now, with the ability to bypass the um, bioimmunity effectively by using AP or or um, K1 
one, then Xeo drones got got really a lot, whole lot of worse now. Yeah, that's true. But I think the Xeo drone Harris is still pretty good because they are fifty point models that have three uh, structure arm fire BTS six. Uh, they're decent at shooting, and that Nexus NCO engineer uh, gives them, of course, the ability to uh, fix the. Uh, Xeo drones, but also the NCO order. So technically, that uh, Harris has uh, thirteen or even fourteen orders to use. Yeah, but at the same time, those are models that uh, don't have primary weapons that have positive range bands beyond twenty-four. They do have access to blitz sense, but um, that's not a main main weapon by any stretch of the imagination. They also they can't see. Uh, can see through smoke, and they entirely lack template weapons. The Xeotrons, uh, on, only the NCO engineer has one. So there are quite um, reasonable ways of countering them, and they too have uh, a tendency, from what I have uh, witnessed, to run into a situations where they are trying to brute force their way through something, and the other side is just not giving in. And at that point, you are spending a lot of orders and not making a lot of progress. So I liked them a lot more when they were extremely tanky and that was their identity. They are almost impossible to take out. Uh, but now that they lack that, I'm left wondering a bit, what are you? Uh, yeah, like you mentioned, Xeodrons aren't the best uh, at taking on really good arrow. arrow. Uh, pieces because they only have BS13 and no like visibility modifiers. Uh, but then you, of course, you have Bit and Kiss that you can throw a repeater next to a strong arrow piece and handle it that way. Uh, they also get access to Suryats, uh, which are not as good in Onyx that, that, as they are in uh, Morats, but still uh, pretty okay. Uh, they have Noctifers also. So they have quite good selection of different combined army units, I think. Yeah, and um, the Unitron fire team is there. You can theoretically build a, a fire team that when you use support where uh, you have effectively BS-17 um, front piece in that model with either plasma sniper or heavy rocket, uh, sorry, missile launcher. And that gets into the Zayedan territory of, of difficult to handle, uh, especially because of the fact that they are dogged with remote presence. So you either have to uh, cause three wounds on them immediately to take them out, or otherwise they're going to go dogged and then they are still there to uh, annoy you until the end of the turn. But at the same time, they are giving a whole lot a whole lot of things uh, when compared to the closest competitor of theirs, which is uh, Vanilla Combined Army. They are a weird sectorial in that usually a sectorial is a thematic um, subsection of, of one type or one uh, race in the case of, of Combined Army units. But here it's like a smaller selection of Vanilla units that isn't that tightly uh, connected even when we're looking at the fire team bonuses. So they give up quite a lot, I feel. Yeah, they have a couple of decent link options, but like nothing really exceptional in terms of flink teams. They are the only one uh, combined army faction that gets access to uh, Crive operators. Um, but at the same time, when others, uh, some of the others, Vanilla and Shazfast, they get access to Specular Killers. Um, that That's also not at all that uh, fantastic. Yeah. I think the one good thing, maybe not in terms of like faction strength, uh, but in general, is that you can uh, create uh, many different kind of builds with uh, Onyx, and also in terms of like faction strength, it's great that uh, your opponent doesn't really know what they are going to be up against when they are playing against Onyx. But on the other hand, then there is nothing that is 
like really dangerous in Onyx either. There's probably some mixed fire team out there that includes <clears throat> stuff like the uh, Suriat plus other PCs that uh, make make a Swiss army knife of a fire team that uh, can uh, legitimize the existence of this faction in, in that list's context. Uh, that's probably out there. But um, yeah, other than that, they are giving up quite a lot uh, for what they get. Yeah. And, and that's the story of uh, quite many factions, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, they could maybe make something like Surya with Tinbot and uh, Umbra Hacker or something like that kind of things, but yeah, they also yeah, start exactly. to be really expensive. Yeah, uh, and, and their list isn't geared towards supporting that type of... Or, yeah, they can with... Um, actually, I'm going to t walk back a bit. If they go heavy on remotes, they can support a top-heavy list like that. And they have the excellent uh, vanilla-type support for those set um, uh, remote units, but yeah. Yeah, but they ha only have AVA one flash pool spots with, which uh, does not help with the top heavy build. But they have Igatrons and uh, Imatrons as well. And Imatrons, uh, so so there you go. Yeah. So where would you place Onyx? This is a tough one. Um, I can almost feel a friend of ours uh, looking behind my soldier as <laughs> shoulder as I. Uh, try and place them. Um, middle of the pack trending on the lowish side of B, I'd say. Yeah, I think they're also close to Tangaska. I'd be willing to place them above because they do have some pretty great hacking presence, but they also can uh, brute force and also uh, sustain damage in ways that Tangaska cannot. Yeah, how about Varuna and Svalarheima? Are they better than those? That's a more difficult question. I'd say not better than um, Svalarheima for sure. Yeah, um, maybe then maybe just... better than Varuna. Let's, I, I, I could go that far. Yeah. yeah maybe between Svalarheim and Varuna then. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. So next we move on to Aleph. So. With Hack Islam, I was talking that their lists are like a jackknife, that you have different kind of tools for different kind of situations. But the weakness with this kind of like jackknife list is that, is that sometimes all you need is a hammer. And Aleph has a lot of hammers. So they have Maru, they have Achilles, they have Atalanta, which are all models that can almost by themselves self, uh, win you the game. And they also have a pretty good amount of cheap orders to uh, support those excellent units like they have uh, flash pool spots, uh, net rods and other stuff. Yeah, I, I like the comparison that you did there. There is some something uh, that's quite similar to Vanilla Hack Islam but in a diametrically opposed way. Um, they are They are a uh, dare I say vanilla faction and therefore uh, inherently powerful, but they also have a, a pretty strong uh, sense of, of being different from many others and they have their, their clear um, uh, pieces that make them who they are and they are also one of those factions that are able to build top heavy and still be very uh, powerful and flexible. Yeah, yeah, I think like one of the biggest strengths in Aleph is that even though if you build a top heavy list, you, you can still build also versatile and flexible lists because there are also cheap models that can do different stuff. And their type, uh, the type of durability uh, that their lists tend to include also means that they are not as susceptible to failure and as susceptible to bad luck as some other factions might be. So, so sometimes things go wrong when you're hacking with your Asura, but they still power through, or Achilles loses a face-to-face -face role, but that's okay. They, he has enough wounds um, and, and raw stats to survive and so forth. So uh, I also like that uh, when it comes to strengths of, of Aleph. Yeah, and 
also like in combined army you can uh, include two of those really good models in the same list. So you could have both Achilles and Atalanta or Achilles, Atalanta and even some other pretty good model in the mix as well. Uh, they also have uh, very good hacking. They have different whip uh, 15 hackers. Uh, but as a downside, they have a relatively weak active turn repeater game. So they have a lot of remotes that are of course repeaters, uh, but they don't have any reliable pitchers or uh, deployable repeaters. Yeah, and I also feel that the um, hacking game of Aleph has more or less remained as is for quite a long time, and many other factions hacking games and, and hacking strategies have improved quite remarkably. So I feel that if, if in the past at some point we could say that Aleph is, is one of the best hacking factions in the entire game, I don't necessarily feel that they are an outlier in that way anymore. Sure, they are powerful, but they are not top tier in my mind. Yeah, and also Aleph lists are all quite uh, SWC hungry. So actually, I think you have to really make a decent decision whether you want to include a missile bot or not in the list. And you can definitely build good Aleph lists without a missile bot, although then you're going to miss one of uh, useful attack vectors that many lists have. For sure. And while many people feel that uh, proxies, uh, posthumous, that is, uh, is is something that more or less um, is not okay, <laughs> or at least is extremely powerful, um, I feel that they are quite nicely costed uh, for for uh, what you're getting with them. And while it's frustrating engaging proxies, knowing that you aren't. Uh, stripping an order from your opponent or, or causing um, traditional uh, what we consider traditionally like damage that affects their play you are still depriving the enemy of a, a piece that they could use to attack you or achieve something else and many other factions also have models that you just have to take out uh, as, uh, as a cost of doing business so there's nothing strange there Oh, and also, if we can compare Aleph to something like Vanilla Combined Army, while the Vanilla Combined Army's support pieces uh, can be more difficult to take out than uh, in many other factions, that's really not the case in Aleph. And if the enemy is able to attack the soft underbelly of the Aleph force, they can strip a lot of orders from them quite quickly and then make uh, life very difficult for the Aleph player. Yeah, so like Vanilla Nomads, they do have the soft underbelly that, uh, well, unlike Nomads, the soft underbelly is not like crucial in terms of like tactical capabilities, but it's crucial in terms of providing orders. Exactly. To, to list. Also, Aleph lacks uh, cheap warbands. So the cheapest actual warband is 16 point Myrmidon, I think. Uh, they all, of course, they do have diggers, which are kind of like warbands, even though they are heavy infantry, but they are also 14 points. So that also limits the their ability to have smoke, which is something that Marut or Atalanta usually likes to have. And also, uh, I have a feeling when it comes to their, uh, they have like a heavy remote type. I always forget the names of, of uh, Aleph remotes, but they do have like this heavy remote type, uh, Rudra. Uh, Rudra, yeah. Uh, I somehow feel with Rudras that they are the first, or at least the prototype version of this heavy remote type unit that we are now seeing more of in, in N4. And as such, they are somewhat conservatively um, built uh, as a unit. They are good, but they aren't game-breaking by any stretch of the imagination. Sure, my dispenser is nice, but they are quite expensive, not all that tough, uh, and so forth. Um, when you compare it to something that, for example, the nomads have access to, I feel that uh, Aleph gets the short end of the stick. Yeah, I think the Rudra with K war 
K1 marksman rifle is okay, but it's not great. And usually you can find better stuff to include in your list. Also, a feeling that I always have when I'm looking at um, vanilla Aleph lists, uh, and and um, I, I even tried building some, is the fact that even though you have access to many of the heroes, Greek heroes of um, Steel Phalanx, there is a lot of synergy that you miss out on by not being able to form fire teams or like the four man fire teams with them. So uh, there, the hero type units can be used to augment um, nomads, vanilla nomads, but they aren't as strong here. Many of them aren't as strong here as they are in, in um, Steel Phalanx, uh, Achilles being a exception, obviously. Yeah, because Achilles works alone anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think Makeon and Uterus can be useful in Vanilla Aleph, uh, but they're both better, obviously, in Steel Phalanx. Uh, and then, of course, Penthesilea is pretty good in Vanilla Aleph. Probably even better in Vanilla Aleph than in, in Steel Phalanx, because yeah, you have yeah. access to more cheap orders in Vanilla. And yeah, those... and you aren't losing out on any any synergy there by using her alone. Yeah. Uh, so are we ready to place Aleph somewhere or? Yeah, yeah, let's add... do that. Where would you place them? I think they could be just ahead of Eugene, but behind Cosmoflot. Hmm. Yeah, I I can I can get behind that. They do impose some of the same feelings that Eugene does. Um, I, I can live with that. I don't have a really strong feeling about Aleph. I would be willing to place them lower also, but I think that's a reasonable place for them to be at. Yeah, I think they are really close to Yujing. They could be like also behind Yujing, but currently my feeling is that they are perhaps slightly better because a few of their units are are better than anything that Yujing has like Maruk, Atalanta, and Achilles. And, and those yeah. are units that sometimes, uh, like I said, can renew the game almost by themselves. But they are not units that like restrict your list building too much, that it makes the list vulnerable in other ways. Although Maruk perhaps is a bit like that. But you can still build a robust list behind Achilles and Atalanta, for example. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and when facing Aleph, you really can't be sure what's going to come at you. So so that's pretty great also. So yeah, yeah, I think that's fine. All right. Uh, then we have Steel Phalanx. So I think Steel Phalanx has probably the best links in the game, even better uh, than Morats, even though they cannot form a f a five man core teams, uh, but their teams are a lot more versatile, so they have good shooting, they are good at CC, they are durable, they have basically everything you want in a link. And you are able to customize those fire teams to achieve what you want them to do, where I was complaining that the Suryat HRL is, is the one-stop shop for all uh, Morat fire teams, more or less. Um, you can really customize a Steel Phalanx fire team to what you want them to achieve by adding the different types of heroes there. And every, each and every one of those brings you something different, some other capabilities, some other possibilities for that fire team. And I really, really like them for that. Even though every time when I face them and I ask who's in that fire team and they give me four Greek names, I go, uh, which ones were these again? But still, I, I really like the way they, they play and I like how they build lists. Yeah, now after the fire or after the uh, faction revision, they also got access to Pandora that is a bit cheaper than the Greek heroes and also gives them access to hacking and GML play that they uh, missed before. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Skulla got a lot better also. So their hacking game was doubly improved. Yeah, they are actually a pretty good hacking faction at the moment, and their I think their aggressive hacking is better than in Vanilla Aleph, funnily. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And they also have the uh, 
what is it called, uh, Ektromoy, uh, the combat jump hacker or parachutist, if you want, which also yeah, has whip yeah. 14. Although they're really aggressively costed for what they do. Yeah, it's only 25 points for whip 14 hacker that has a parachutist and combat jump. And one more thing about the fire teams is the fact that many of the Greek units or the heroic units, however you want to call them, uh, have either impetuous or frenzy and they get the full use out of the frenzy and impetuous discount by forming fire teams where those uh, those are uh, basically optional skills that you can utilize when it serves you and ignore when you want to. So that's really great also. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I would say that the only weakness of Steel Phalanx perhaps is uh, is guided missile play. That they don't. Well, I think Hector has a team, but but Hector is another like vulnerability by itself uh, in regards of uh, GML play. But other than that, they don't have team, but they have uh, quite expensive models that have like almost no defense against uh, hacking and, and GML. That's true. It, though I have to um, include the caveat here that they are one of those factions that has access to devastating hidden deployed arrow pieces in the form of hidden deployed Atalanta uh, and the uh, Agima Marksman missile launcher especially. And those are the types of pieces that a savvy player can use to try and draw out, for example, the picturing or repeated carrying assets of the enemy and then try and engage them. And while that's not necessarily cost effective and it's far from uh, certain, that does give them some counterplay in that regard also. So I, I also like them for that. And the heroes tend to have uh, decent willpower and high physique. Many of them can take more than one wound. So it's often the right call for a hero to reset when being fired upon by a, a GML because they're likely to not go down and at least not all the way to dead when they get hit. And if they can reset, then they can uh, clear the table and, and be more or less safe until they get spotlit again. Yeah, and usually you also have a doctor in the link, so you have to like totally kill the models, which cost more orders. Uh, but the one weakness in Steel Phalanx is, of course, that if, if you lose like only one or two models, your links are already much worse. Yeah, you lose the sixth sense after the first model, so that really, really hits you hard, especially when uh, you're faced with the GML play. Yeah, and also you lose one order, and like orders is something that Steel Phalanx doesn't necessarily have that many. Yeah, and, and when there are models that um, produce several orders by themselves via tactical awareness or effectively produce orders through NCO, when you lose those models, then you also lose those orders at the same time. Yeah. Uh, they do have, uh, if I co remember correctly, they do have access to uh, AVA2 um, touchy modos at the moment. So that's also, yeah, that's also a, a good advantage of theirs. They can pack quite a lot of orders into a smaller amount of models. So are we ready to rate them? Uh, yeah, it's the one last thing I want to add is, uh, I guess when building lists with Teal Phalanx, I guess the, like, the main question is that do you want two hero links or only one? And if you are playing with two hero links, you can like make a pretty good almost limited insertion list where you have like a couple of flash pool spots and maybe a war core in the second group and two really strong links in the first group. And that's still a really good list. Uh, but yeah, I would place Steel Phalanx definitely in A tier, probably ahead of Vanilla Aleph. Yeah, I feel that's the right spot for them. Behind Cosmoflot because no bears, <laughs> but, but still. Yeah, let's place Steel Phalanx there. So next we move on to OSS. Uh, I think here the faction defining units are definitely the Dakinis, uh, which are 
great and affordable. So there are effectively BS17 units with mimetism minus three uh, that have access to HMG and Molde Sniper Rifle, or even both. And they can even add Deva into the link to give some protection against hacking and to give number two for the link, which can be quite useful. They also have access to uh, an Asura Lieutenant plus one order hacker hacking device plus profile, which is, uh, I feel, by far the best Asura profile out there, and it's not available to Vanilla LF. Yeah, I think after Anathematic, the, uh, that Asura is the second best hacker in the game. Although, like in Vanilla LF, the downside in Asura is that you don't have bit and keys to provide you repeaters. So you actually have to get Asura uh, herself or then some kind of a bot in next to the enemy. But it's still a really good good hacker. And then of course uh, OSS has access to Maruts and post humans, which are both good. And you can even if you if you want, you can even add Marut and a Dakini core team in your list. Although then it's those two things are probably the only things you're going to have in your list that can actually do something or anything like significant, but it's still a possible list build. And actually, now that I checked, um, OSS does get Danavas hackers in a core or Harry's of Dakinis. So you could theoretically have a Dakini plus two Danavas fire team. Uh, that would be firing burst two pitchers, but uh, that's only at BS11. And as a rule, I feel that while uh, OSS is really cool, they are also a bit conservatively uh, built for, uh, sectorial. And while they are more of Aleph in the sense that they have even better hacking options, um, and they they can um, lean more heavily on on the Dakini uh, and the remote side um, due to the Dakini fire team and what it can achieve, especially when combined with an Evo hacker. At the same time, it's less of an LF in in how how well it takes punches and uh, with the lack of all the Creek units, um, the close range performance and the aggressive close close range performance, uh, both offensively and defensively, is is uh, adversely affected. So they are they have clear weaknesses in in that sense. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think uh, they're a bit like Morats in a sense that they are very straightforward, predictable faction, but in the different in Morats in terms that they are a lot less durable. So if we go back into Dakinis, uh, they also have a lot of weaknesses. So uh, they are quite weak to hacking. They don't have any like tin bots or anything. Uh, they're obviously only one wound model. So one unlucky face to face uh, will take out the Dakini. Of course they have remote presence so you can bring them back up, but it's not gonna help at that moment when the Dakini goes down. Uh, they also very vulnerable against EM weapons, against direct template weapons and CC. And also, like when a one Dakini goes down, uh, you lose instantly two points of ballistic skill. If you lose the Evo bot, you lose effectively three points of ballistic skill. And then rebuilding the Dakini links uh, takes a lot of command tokens. And while it's quite uh, plausible that when you lose a Dagini, they only go into unconscious due to remote presence, it still takes orders to get them back operational, and it still takes command, to command tokens to reform the fire team if you choose to do so. So that's not a situation where where the uh, OSS player gets to walk walk away from the situation without having suffered any any adverse effects to their ability to continue fighting. Yeah, and if the opponent is not providing you easy targets for the Dakinis, then they probably have to move forward. Uh, but the more forward they move, the more vulnerable they start to be against different kind of threats. And Dakinis are one of those weird fire teams where they have access to paramedics, but they aren't paramedicable themselves. So they don't bring um, organic uh, revival support with them, um, like many other fire teams do. 
Yeah, and there in general, there is not much that the Dakini paramedics can actually heal in uh, OSS because most of the units that have wounds have also no wound incapacitation. Uh, but they pretty much the only like revival units are motorized bounty hunters, which are actually really good in OSS by providing or CSUs if you choose to include those, but they don't count as Dakinis, so probably not. Yeah. <laughs> also, OSS lacks smoke itself, and its multispectral visor pieces are uh, the top hitters. So you're talking, we're talking uh, Asuras, we're talking um, Dart, and we're talking Marut, and those are elements that are quite easy to bypass. Uh, because the uh, OSS player has to play more or less conservatively with them to avoid losing them. So smoke can blind, for example, the set Dakinis and then make them easy, easier to engage. Yeah, or just avoid. Which is yeah, just or good. avoid. While, while the OSS player can just smoke the objective and avoid what's guarding it, they basically have to engage it one way or another. Yeah, and then OSS also lacks warbands which makes them a lot more vulnerable against any kind of threats that are coming to your face, especially if the Dakinis are uh, blinded by smoke. Yeah, exactly. I think one kind of like interesting link that I would like to try in OSS, I'm not sure if it's any good or not, is having Asura Hacker, Rudra and Parvati in a Harris. Uh, I have no idea if that would uh, work in real life and it's really expensive, but it could have some potential, I think. It sounds sounds like something that e either gets the job done or gets killed and then you lose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that link is basically taking half of your points. Uh, overall, I think OSS has few very strong but vulnerable uh, PCs and lacks versatility and robustness. And they are pretty predictable, like we mentioned. So I think that places them only in C tier, in my opinion. But I think ahead of talk. Yeah, low B, high C. Yeah, I I I can live with with uh, top of C. I think many people consider OSS to be better, but from a tournament perspective, if you are taking OSS to a tournament, you are most likely going to run up up against a good player who knows how to play against a predictable faction like OSS. And yeah, it's, it's really really not a faction that gets my heart rate heart rate up when I hear I'm going to face them next. Yeah, and you know that there are only like a couple of things that you need to like beat in that faction. Mainly the Ducky Link, maybe a Marut, maybe a Sura. If you can handle those, it's going to be pretty easy to beat OSS. There might be something there somewhere. Uh, the Link Fire Team you mentioned. Uh, a friend friend of uh, mine is is trying out some different types of OSS list at the moment, but so far, yeah, that that's uh, that's what my feelings also. Yeah, I think it's quite similar to many like older factions that haven't been revised for some time. Is that they start to lack versatility and options. And in in the current state of the meta, you get punished for what you can't do, and and uh, there are a lot of things that OSS can't do, unfortunately. Yes, exactly. Uh, next, we will move on to O12. So, what are your thoughts about Vanilla O12? Well, many consider Vanilla O12 to be the vanilla faction of vanilla factions. They are a newer faction, they have access to most of the cool stuff. Um, their profiles tend to be on the more effective side, uh, but nothing game-breaking there. So I feel they are a good good all-rounded faction, but nothing, nothing spectacular. Um, they were pushed um, early in, in the um, Code 1 expansion uh, if i remember correctly and i feel that this gave the hint that they were seen at least from the get-go as a beginner friendly uh, type of army for for those getting into the game yeah i think that sums up it pretty well for o12 actually so they have an excellent selection of good units but they lack excellent or super strong units so if you look at the s and a tier factions all of those have some like super strong 
units or super strong combination of units in linked teams. But O12 doesn't really have anything that is super strong. They have some pretty good synergies in their units, but also nothing that is like really stands out. And my experience with O12 is that they are pretty good against like B tier factions or lower, but when they are facing an A tier faction, uh, they start to struggle because they they can't really beat nomads or ca in a hacking game uh, they cannot outshoot some other factions and basically all the a and s tier factions they have something like that's really good that it's really hard for o12 to deal with yeah and also i also feel that many b tier factions also have something while they have weaknesses that o12 might be able to capitalize on they also have things that they can use to overpower o12 with yeah, that's also true. And, and like you said, usually they have weaknesses that O12 can exploit, but those A tier factions usually lack those weaknesses that O12 could efficiently exploit. Uh, and I have a feeling with O12, um, this is probably my last, last thought on them since they are quite vanilla uh, in a way, but I have a feeling that um, the riot stoppers were supposed to have a stronger gameplay effect and that was supposed to be part of the um, way this faction works they were supposed to be their type of shotgun when when comparing to hack islam for example but um, you don't see people getting shot by riot stoppers all that often now do you yeah, riot stoppers are not very useful, I think. There are corner case situations where, where I have been shot with them, but it's not usually something that you need to be that worried about. Um, riot stoppers can be used to immobilize powerful enemies, but at the same time, um, it's only, only a mobility kill uh, in the most uh, basic <laughs> meaning of the, of the word. Of the term because the enemy is still providing an order they are still controlling uh, zones that they are part of they can still break free uh, using their their own orders and you can um, pile more orders on on that dodge roll if you need to break free un unlike when you're trying to reset out of isolation so it's not really that strong of a mechanic uh, and and um Many units have high physique, so they are able to pass the save anyway from the get-go, so yeah. Yeah, they're only a little bit more reliable than shotguns, but they don't cause wounds. Uh, where should we place O12? I think somewhere in the upper half of B tier. Yeah, I'd, I'd be comfortable with that. Uh, how would you feel about placing them somewhere around the Assassins, maybe? Uh. Yeah, I would agree with that. Ahead or behind assassins? I'd be willing to put them behind because assassins do have some mechanical strings in, for example, impersonation and picture play that uh, the O12 struggles to um, replicate. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And uh, do not take our lack of excitement on O12 uh, in a way that O12 is not an exciting faction. I think O12 is a really, really interesting faction, but in terms of like tier list, they are really vanilla. So there's not that much here that we need to talk about O12. Although I think there is a lot that we could talk about O12 if we're doing only a faction analysis on them. Sure. And and they, they, they have all the fundamentals that they need to succeed. And I also feel that there is a lot of list building depth there that you can do a whole lot of different things with them, especially now that new units have been added to them. So uh, just like Panda said, don't be discouraged by <laughs> how we describe them as very vanilla. Yeah, yeah. Like the gameplay with them is not like vanilla because they can build so many different kind of lists they have so many different kind of excellent units or at least good units i was actually challenged to play a game with vanilla uh o12 um lately uh and and getting to fire a plasma carbine uh from uh, what's the hidden deployed guide links uh was was quite quite uh, satisfactory let's just put it that way 
Yeah, yeah, Lynx is a really good example of a like good unit that O12 has, and they have like different great profiles. I think the sniper, the killer hacker, and the plasma carbine links are all great. Should we move on to Starmada? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, what do you think about Starmada? Uh, they're probably the faction that has improved the most during the past year. Yeah, they just got uh, a whole, um, well, not a whole lot, but they got significant um, upgrades of late. Um, from the get-go, it was for many uh, difficult to um, get behind playing Starmada uh, uh, from at least a competitive standpoint, because when you take a new vanilla faction that has less units than many others in, in O12, and then you cut down that selection of units even further to form a more thematic subsection of that faction, uh, then the fire team options or or uh, AVA bonuses that you get have to be really kick ass for that to make sense. And and from the get go, the Starmada fire teams weren't seen as that excellent. Uh, there are some some um, units that you get here that you don't get in in vanilla O12. Uh, some of them excellent and some of them a bit so so. But now with the addition of, of especially the robots, but to a lesser extent also um, Raven Eye officers, um, Sarkos and Sekudroids, there are um, new things to get excited about with, uh, with this faction. Yeah, especially the uh, FO bot plus robot duos are really good and they can have two of those. And you mentioned Sarkos, they are also Something that O12 was really lacking was this cheap uh, midfield camo specialist, and Sarkos are exactly that, and they are great at that role. And sorry, I also missed Bixie. Bixie is amazing. Yeah, Bixie is also amazing, and they have some pretty decent link options for Bixie. Although the I think Bixie with Bixie links, the downside is that those links are quite expensive, but they they do have good link options. And they, of course, they have access to Jetta, which is a great tag. Uh, but if we go to the weaknesses of Starmada, I think the biggest weakness is the uh, lack of cheap orders. So if I'm not mistaken, they have only one flash pull spot. Yeah, and yeah. a general lack of access to other really cheap uh, order providing models. Yeah, also only two Varangian guards. Uh, so basically you start to you need to start include Kappa units to get cheap orders in your team or Ravenite, but they are already 12 points a piece. So even though you have a lot of really good units, uh, you can't include all of them in your list because you lack those cheap orders. And I think that makes the list building with uh, Starmada quite difficult. Yeah, and their hacking presence isn't all that impressive. You can get the decent hacking network going with them, but it's not spectacular um, from at least what I have um, experienced and studied. Uh, and even their new exciting units are something that can be stopped in, in quite traditional ways. Uh, we were talking about, uh, for example, when we were talking about Yu Ching, uh, how the uh, Sujian can be stopped by something as simple as a well re uh, well placed repeater. Well, when we are taking a look at a robot, that's basically in many ways a Sujian light. Well, that's doubly the case here also. Um, and while there are some nice nice um, fire teams that you can form, as uh, for example with the Psychops. Um, with, with multispectral visors and so forth. Uh, many of the Starco elements uh, or, or Starmada elements um, can stand up to a dedicated close assault. So there's a weakness there also. Yeah, that's also true. And they, although they have some war bands in having two Varangians, they are still not that great in the uh, war band game as many other factions. So where should should we place Starmada, or do you still have some other thoughts? 
No, maybe the only thought is that we haven't seen and heard everything about them yet. Um, there may be that some assessments made about the impact of the new models has been um, hyped up too much, but at the same time there is surely <clears throat> a lot here that we haven't seen or discovered yet, so there's some uncertainty uncertainty there, but um, we are going B, surely. Mm, maybe low B tier, because they have, they have great units, but they just lack cheap orders to build an actually efficient list. Uh, with those units, yeah, I think I, I have seen some some lists, for example, where you, where you get the Z data tag, you get um, a Kappa fire team, a uh, couple of robot uh, Oko fire teams, and a hacker, uh, maybe some war band. So you get more or less what you need, but there's not a lot of uh, room there to to. Um, um, tailor the list, and then if you start to include more of the heavier elements, then you have to cut something. So, yeah, middle of the pack B maybe. I do. I would consider them more powerful than Onyx, for example, uh, and probably more powerful than um, Corregidor also. Really, that high? Yeah, I think you need to post me that list because it sounds better than anything that I've been able to build. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'll, I'll do my best. But yeah, I'm willing to uh, trust you on this and put them ahead of Corregidor. Although I have to say that in the next ITS season, if they take out the bonuses to FO bots... If and when, we assume. Yeah, they might uh, retain some of those bonuses or they might, their cost might increase. But when that happens, I think that will knock them down a few places. In our yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, the tactical awareness is really the thing here, and that's surely something that's gonna go. So, for so for that reason alone, let's not place them too high. Yeah, I mean, we will place them like as high as they are right now, but with the caveat that when the rules change in next ITS season, they may drop down a few places. Yeah, sure. Okay, let's place them ahead of Corregidor for now. Okay, yeah, I feel comfortable with that. All right. Then we move on to Toha. I will let you take this one since you are a long-time Toha player yourself. All right, so in the beginning of N4, I feel that Toha was definitely an A-tier faction. They felt really strong at that point because people had not learned how to play N4 and people have had not learned how to play against Toha that got the uh, new Takel unit with uh, endgame Ferroware. But I think now that we have been playing N4 for two and a half years, uh, I feel that Toha is in a bit of a tricky uh, spot at the moment. And the reason is that like people have learned how to play against Doha, at least some people have. Uh, Doha still has a lot of strengths, but they have some like really noticeable weaknesses. Uh, but if we start with the strengths of Doha, uh, they have many good units that can link uh, all with each other. So they have Sukels who are great at shooting. Basically they have the Missile Launcher, HMG, K1 Sniper and K1 Combi. Uh, which are all great profiles uh, with BS-13, Mimetism minus six, and basically two wounds. Uh, they have McCall's. Mimetism minus three, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, minus three, yeah, sorry. Uh, they have McCall's that are great in close combat, provide heavy flamethrower, and have Eclipse grenades, and when you have Probably those... the best warband in the game. Yeah, I would say so, especially in the Toha context, when you have them in a three-man link, so they get burst two for their Eclipse grenades, so that basically means that you can throw Eclipse quite reliably up to 16 inches because you're really rolling tens uh, twice, so it's 75% chance of hitting that. And smoke. you're also defending in ARO with two dice 16 against basically everything. Yeah, uh, then as a feeler, you also can take Sakiels in those link, especially the Sakiel paramedic is a great profile, 19.2 wound uh, specialist. That can also fire those medikits to uh, their fallen Toha comrades 
with burst two. Uh, then you have Kyle Tars for more defensive links uh, to provide chain of command if you want and provide Symbio uh, mates and Symbio bombs. Uh, then also you have Takel. They are not as great as, at shooting at, at the Sukels are, but they have those fair aware attacks, uh, both mirror ball and end game, which are both really good. And of course you have the draw as another option. Uh, then uh, the model that I guess most people are most afraid of when facing Doha, Jan Star, which I feel is a model that can sometimes win the game by itself. And I've had like several games where I have won the game on turn one, only with Jan Star. On the other hand, the like downside of Jan Star is that it has only light shot kind of viral pistols, and even with Symbio mates, it has only two wounds with quite weak armor. So it's a bit unreliable, I feel. So if you are going up against like uh, light infantry units, uh, it's really good. But then if your opponent uh, knows to expect Jan Star like they usually do. They can set up arrows pretty well if they have some like more durable units. It can be more hard to actually get kills with Jan Star. Yeah, and he's a very much go first type of unit. If you lose lieutenant role and the opponent chooses to go first, the value that he has gets greatly impacted in a yeah. negative way. Yeah, so like my experience with Jan Star is that probably a bit more than 50% of the games, I will go first. Uh, during those games, maybe half of the time, Jan Star has a huge impact and helps me to win the game. But the rest of those times, uh, I spend most of my turn one orders on Jan Star, get maybe a bit unlucky or run into uh, difficult arrows that are coming from different directions or against like more durable models, I maybe get only one or two kills. And I lose Jan Star on, on my opponents like next turn, and I have basically spent all my first turn doing that and not achieved much. And then, of course, about 50% of the time, I will not be able to go first, and then Jan Star is only an okay model at best. So it's kind of a like polarizing model uh, that helps you a lot in some games, but when you're playing a five round tournament, Jan Star is not likely to. <laughs> give you like consistent wins in those games yes and and many opponents excellent or like tournament uh, winner caliber opponents are expecting that they might be facing young star at some some stage and they are trying to prepare for that and the i feel that uh, the nine point mind laying beast hunter that most factions have access to is a pretty cost effective uh, and a reasonable way of trying to deter um, and slow down a, a young star play. So there is the possibility that the opponent is ready for that and is trying to make your life difficult. And at some point, uh, using young star gets more trouble, more, you more trouble than, than what, it, what it's worth. Yeah. Yeah. The difficult thing about the beast hunter is that if you have to dodge the mine with Jan Star or just take the mine and you don't kill the Beast Hunter, then it has the heavy flamethrower that can kill you outright if you don't have the mate anymore. So you might have to use a Liberto to first uh, detonate the mine and then move forward with Jan Star. And it uh, gets a bit more tricky. And in general, like playing Jan Star also, like it takes a lot of skill if your opponent knows how to play well. Then maybe as a last like big strength of Toha, I would add that they are pretty durable. Many of their units have two wounds and they can get Symbio mates as well, so they are pretty resistant against bad luck. Uh, but then, if we move on to the weaknesses of Toha and the reasons why I don't think they are an A-tier faction anymore, first of all, they have no hacking, and we have like spent quite a lot of time in this video series to talk about how important hacking and GML play as an option is at this point of the game. Also, they have basically no defense against hacking either. Or they... that, I feel that's really the big part here. They, yeah, they can. <clears throat> Doha can, to some extent, uh, dupli uh, replicate the the tactical impact of GML play by using endgame and other fairware. 
uh, but uh, they have absolutely no defense against it. Let's say uh, we're talking about the more powerful Ariadna factions, they can, for example, use their large numbers of camouflaged models to uh, defend against uh, guided missiles, but Doha don't get that luxury at all, basically. Yeah, like Ariadna, especially Vanilla, but also many of the sectorials as well, have usually only a couple of models that are really vulnerable against GML play, like Unknown Ranger, but camouflage markers or those with total immunity don't really care about guided missiles. Uh, so basically the only defense that Toha has against hacking is their wounds and the symbiomates that they can usually try to reset uh, against the first missile and if they succeed then the enemy will have to spotlight them again. But because Toha relies so heavily on having those three man links and they have access only to three man links, uh, just giving one model from the link uh, with a guided missile already basically takes out all the bonuses that the link has. And part of the strength of the faction uh, seems to be <clears throat> the high mobility and the high order economy achieved by moving three models together towards the enemy or the midfield and, and doing different things with the different models. But that also uh, makes it so that the entire group is susceptible to getting spotlit in ARO with, with little to no chance to defend themselves. And when you start to have several of, of your models getting spotlit, then, then it's game over for Toha, basically. Yeah, and they are usually only with 13, so resetting against spotlights, it's not that easy. And when you are being, or you haven't been spotlit, you only have 50% chance of uh, resetting against it when you're uh, facing a missile. And uh, what you mentioned takes us to the second big weakness that I think Toha has, is that uh, they're a pretty slow faction. Most of the models that you want to attack with, mainly the like, fire teams that they have, uh, start from their own deployment zone and have 4-4 move. And they don't get any additional orders. Well, the only exception of the Thakel with lose an order plus one. Uh, plus one lose an order, but uh, when you spend those two turn on orders, you obviously are not going to be in a link. You could take Ectros and CO, but it's not a very good model. But the fact that you have these slow triads that start from a deployment zone with only at maximum 10 orders for them means that it's, it is going to take a long way for them to like go from your own DC to the enemy DC. And when they get there, there's only a few orders that they can spend to actually kill stuff. And then if they like end up staying there uh, at the end of the turn, it's going to be relatively easy for your opponent to kill all those three models. So it's also very easy to overextend with Toha. Or maybe I should say that it's really hard to find the balance of like being efficient and not overextending, especially if your opponent is playing well. And it's pretty pretty easy for a uh, opponent who has access to a, a good uh, GML vector, thre threat vector to counter attack these advancing triads by pushing a repeat uh, into within eight inches of them and then start spotlighting and then them and taking them out. While this is not a surefire thing, uh, surefire way of getting rid of them, it's also a way where the Doha cannot uh, attack back in any way. So. Uh, it, it can be really frustrating for the Doha player. Yeah, yeah. theoretically they have access to Alice Kaysan that has a killer hacking device, but I feel it, uh, he's more, or he or she, I'm not sure uh, of the gender. But anyway, I feel that it's more of a vulnerability to Doha links of having it there than, uh, than not having it. And, exactly. And, and also... One... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. And also on top of this, Toha is only okay at shooting. Like Sukeos with BS-13 and Mimilis minus 3 are pretty good, but it's the best that they have. And their only weapons are normal HMG, uh, missile launcher or K1 sniper, which means that they are going to be targets that they just can't win in a face-to-face. -face. Like Atalanta is going to be really difficult. For that, they of course have the Eclipse grenades, but it's going to take a lot of orders to if you have to like move forward and throw eclipse grenades to block uh, fire lanes. 
Yeah, and at the same time, the fact that the Doha fire teams are only allowed to go up to three people means that Doha units are susceptible to uh, surprise attacks because they are unable to gain the sixth sense bonus from their fire teams. And also the faction only has a single MSV2 unit in the Gar Rail. And if you are wanting to use that as an Overwatch beast, then you are play, uh, paying 33 points and a unit slot in a fire team for a BS-12 model with just the standard sniper rifle. And that's one SWC also. So what that means is that most Doha lists that we tend to see don't have MSV-2. Uh, they may have some MSV-1, but the MSV-1 carries the danger of getting smoked and then shot through for, for a negative effect. And this is something that all the Doha units are also susceptible to. Somebody throwing smoke and then shooting through that, like in the heydays of N3 all over again. So that's also a significant um, weakness of theirs that they can struggle to to overcome yeah yeah totally and even though ferroware is good especially end game uh if your opponent knows how to play against them they keep their distance or use models with uh structure or teen bots uh suddenly the end game becomes not useless but not very efficient and and in general like having just a burst to uh, damage 13 weapon is not the most reliable in itself. The good thing, of course, is that it's kind of like riskless face to face. But when the opponent keeps their distance, uh, there are not going to be many opportunities to actually use the end game. For sure. And, and the, f the fact that uh, it can't be used against models with strength, uh, just like you said, is a huge disadvantage because that denies Doha the um, indirect attack vector to take out things like uh, remotes and uh, repeaters. So when the enemy is able to place those at choke points that the Doha isn't able to bypass, then, then it can be lights out pretty quickly. Yeah. So, so they, they seem like a do or die faction. They either overpower you with the good stuff they have or they get overpowered themselves because of the stuff that they can't do and can't effectively defend against. Yeah, yeah, I think that sums up Doha pretty well. And like, if you need to tell your opponent what endgame is, you're probably going to win that game. But if your opponent is prepared and knows how to play against Doha, Doha can really start to struggle. So I still have some games where I play up against opponents where uh, that have maybe not played N4 that much and don't or haven't faced Doha ever and they play like this normal way of infinity when they bring their troops in the midfield and hide them bef behind some buildings or uh, put them in suppressive fire and, and I just take Dark L there and kill them with endgame. Uh, but once like people have learned that okay this is how endgame works this is not how you or this like most intuitive way of playing Infinity is not how you play against Doha, and they keep their distance. Uh, they maybe fire some pitchers, kill a couple of models, and stay in their own deployment zone. Let Doha come to them. Then Doha is really like they can't really use their own strengths in those kind of matchups. And also the last big weakness that Doha has in like terms of tournament play. Is that there are many missions like highly classified countermeasures, frostbite, where Doha also will really struggles. Well, they have to build a different kind of list specifically for that mission, and those kind of lists that may they might need to take hackers or engineers or something like that is also far away from what they do the best. So they have and to... in including heavy infantry is uh, quite difficult for them, and they don't have remotes at all. So frostbite is, espe is especially uh, difficult for them. Yeah, and I think because of that, unlike it's good to keep in mind that in some matchups uh, against some opponents, the Toha can still feel definitely like an eight-year faction. But overall, in a tournament setting, I think currently Toha is only a middle of B tier, probably. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So maybe behind O12, uh, ahead of Invincible Army.
I'm willing to trust you on, on this one for sure. Yeah, this might be surprising to some people who don't have so much or who have some experience against Doha and especially experience of being crushed by Doha. But next time when you play against Doha, if you have these experiences, try to keep your distance, use indirect ways of play, like having uh, guided missiles, uh, using units with structure or tin bots, and probably Doha is start starting to struggle against that kind of play. Then next we could take Spiral Corp. Yeah, that feels natural because they share many of the units that uh, Doha has. Yeah, even though like if I look at my Doha lists and then start to build Spiral Corp lists, uh, usually those models that I uh, makes up most of my Doha lists are not actually accessible in Spiral. So they don't have Sukeus, Makaus, Takeus, Sakils or Liberto and they have only ABA1 Kyltars. They get uh, a substitute, they get some like models that Doha doesn't have, like the uh, Viral Sniper Dogma or the Smoke Grenade Launcher uh, Kriegel, but I feel that those are not nearly as good as the units that Doha has, but Spiral doesn't. Yeah, and the backstory of the faction is that they are a uh, Doha human uh, mixed mercenary uh, like company. And the human side is really underdeveloped in them, I feel. The access to mercenary human units that they have is quite small. We're, ba mo we're yeah, mostly... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, basically brawlers and anaconda. Yeah, yeah that's and, and monstruckers and, and uh, maybe like war, war, uh, war driver or something. But yeah, they for a while had diggers and you were able to build a pure fire team core of uh, diggers brawlers and dogmas and i feel that that was something cool and that was something that i was willing to get behind uh, i actually own a spiral core army and i have maybe played them twice in n4 because the I, I find personally the list of models and the way they play to be extremely uh, unattractive there are some cool units here, like Gielsan, and you can now form a Gielsan Kauri Sentinel fire team, which is pretty cool. Uh, trial supporters are good, but the list of list of good units quickly runs its course, and then you are just repeating the same things with the same guys uh, quite quickly. And at the same time, while they aren't uh, a faction that's not capable of hacking, their hackers are pretty bad. You're talking brawlers, you're talking one SWC war drivers, um, and, <laughs> and the mystifying uh, Dark Ma Don't Hit Me uh, hacker who only has like white noise. <laughs> so, so, so you're effectively making a guy a hacker so that he can be attacked by other hackers and then not giving him anything to do except try and fend them off. So, yeah. so yeah. that's pretty, pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, not even white noise, only zero pain. Ah, uh, sorry, yeah, zero pain. Yeah, yeah, that was what, that was. Yeah, what, that's, that's a really was... mysterious hacker. I guess the only point is that it's a specialist, but. You for, really need... for goodness sake. <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, you really need to have a better specialist. <laughs> and at the same time, they really don't have repeaters at all, I think. Uh, and the most damning of all, while I like the Kriegel agent uh, Ferro Booster guy, and there is technically some hacking here, the guided platform of Doha and Spiral Core is a heavy rocket launcher instead of missile launcher. And try, try playing a few games where you substitute the missile for a heavy rocket from, from the GML and you realize how neutered that unit immediately becomes. Because you're not only banking on hitting, uh, hitting your shot and the enemy not dodging, uh, they also only have to pass one save, and even if they take, uh, fail, they take one wound, and then they get to try and pass another save to not take any further wounds. So that's really, really frustrating. Yeah, it does not have AP either. No, no AP, no nothing. So the enemy can usually just quite 
quite uh, reliably reset out of it and then tank the hit or, or maybe go unconscious and then be still recoverable. Even if you go through all the trouble of walking your hacker over there from your deployment zone and, and <laughs> targeting them, so no thank you. Yeah. If you try to find something positive about Spiral is that they get uh, three impersonators and they have access to guillotines with submachine gun and EM mines, which I think is a pretty good profile. They also have access to helots, which are nice, but they're not really a model that can carry a faction. And they're again not Libertos and Toha get Libertos, because why not? Yeah, of course. Although they get like three helots, Toha gets only one Liberto. But usually, like Liberto is both a defensive and an offensive model. Helots are only a defensive model, mostly, like we talked about in a previous episode. So I would not really compare Helots to Liberto. And one really big hit that the uh, Spiral Core took in the Fireteam update was the fact that one of their unique selling points has been the Tagma Schemer uh, Dry Core. Which basically means that you get full fire team bonuses, five man fire team bonuses, just from having a three man fire team. <clears throat> well, uh, import that into the modern way that fire teams work. So uh, if you put your Tagma into anything that's not a brawler, pure brawler core, which is basically just Tagmas and brawlers, nothing else. If you don't do that, you only get six cents and plus one BS from for, for your troubles. So you're paying, you're including a 20 point model with uh, 0.5 SWC cost to give one BS and six cents until you lose one guy from the fire team, and at that point you lose all the bonuses effectively. Yeah, that's so. Ah, uh, that's rough, man. Yeah, I think they should have changed the tri core rule to give pure fire team bonuses. It's still would, everything. Yeah, yeah, it still would, would sense. not have made Spiral like in any way too good of a faction. No, no. Then you would be do, able to do something cool like having a full fire team bonus Anaconda in a fire team. Yeah, that's that's yeah. cool. That that's mercenary there for you shooting left and right with the HMG and then po uh, popping out and using the, the Spitfire uh, when the tag goes down. Anacondas aren't too good by any stretch of the imagination. So something like that. But they really, especially after losing pro, um, diggers, they really do feel like they need some help. Yeah, I totally agree. So I guess we're talking about C tier. And yeah, yeah, for low, sure. Low C tier. Maybe just ahead of US Ariadna, or would you rate them higher than IS? No, I would not. So let's place them between US Ariadna and ISS. Yeah, let's do that. Next, we finally have the non aligned armies, and we start with Druze. So for a long time, uh, Druze was the, one of the worst factions in the game. Uh, but now they are quite okay, I think. First of all, like if you really want to play an aggressive repeater game, uh, they have access both to Drews, who can form quite easily a pure uh, core fire team, and they have access to AVA2 Hunsakuts. So you're definitely going to have a way to deliver a repeater into your opponent's deployment zone. And on top of that, they have Valeria, who can who is a whip 14 hacker to support the hacking game. Yeah, for sure. And they also have uh, the highly um, aggressive pan O remotes that can also be used to extend your repeater network uh, beyond the standard normal remotes everyone has. They also have bulleters and peacemakers, which also give you the possibility of extending a hacking network through advancing with those models. Yeah, and what is actually really interesting in Druze is that they have AVA3 Pathfinders, which is great ah, during that. during this season. And I think this is really nice game design by CB, that they're giving something unique 
to a faction that is not in any way overpowered, but still useful and makes it a bit more interesting to play them and give some like unique unique list building options. So in Druze, well, you definitely have a way to target your opponents. And also correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Saito Togan has specialist operative profile in Druze, and I don't think that's accessible anywhere else. Yeah, I think you're correct. So I think Druze is the only one who has the specialist operative Saito Togan, which also makes Saito a lot more useful. Unit. I have quite liked him even without specialist operative when running JSA. So being able to have him be a specialist for a mere point, I feel makes him pretty great. Yeah, and I think like specialist side though is a model that JSA would really want to have because they kind of lack in that specialist game. Uh, more yeah, about that sure. later. And also he's a ninja that also has smokes. So he's the true side though is kind of the whole package of a ninja uh, but other good things in Druze is that they have pretty good pure Druze fire teams uh, that don't even require an actual Druze so they, they can use brawlers, diggers and Druze and also Ida, Swanson so I mean they're not overly strong fire team but still like pretty good and versatile and relatively cheap fire teams and they have also some like other good units like Scarface, Fiddler, and Armand. They also get Bashes uh, with ABA4, so there's plenty of those guys. Um, Tauvu and Modras Bounty Hunters make an appearance here also. So I, I agree that they are better than their traditional faction narrative would have you believe. Uh, they do feel a uh, bit, um, bit on the uh, smaller side when it comes to a selection of troops that they can field. It's basically your, your truce and counts as truce, uh, the aforementioned Hunsaku Tsuan Yuan's remotes, a couple of tag options, and that's really it. There isn't really that much depth in, in the factions bench, uh, so to speak. That's not to say that they can play in different styles and, and perform uh, several different types of strategies inside a single list, but they may feel like a bit of a smaller faction uh, for you to play and collect them, I feel. Yeah, I agree. They, they do have versatility, but they lack depth. So usually you always have to take the same options when you're building a list with Jews, although there is nothing wrong with those options. Uh, that they have. Besides that, I think they have two other weaknesses. One is their like lack of strong, uh, lack of like strong long range shooting. So they have some like decent uh, long range options like Scarface, the Druze or Brawler uh, fire teams, and Armand, but nothing really strong uh, that can deal with hard arrows although uh they have the hacking game that they can deal with some really hard arrows like atalanta or pure core linked riot girl missile launcher etc uh and also the truths <clears throat> don't take hits all that well while you can use diggers to some degree protect your fire teams from close range assaults if the enemy get to you with stuff like shotguns and grenades and and uh, other smoke and and attacking through through that at close ranges then they start to fall apart pretty quickly yeah that's the other weakness that Drews has that they lack durability uh diggers are the only heavy infantry unit in the faction and in general they have only a very few multi wound units so you have to be really careful when you play with Drews and you uh, don't really have, have much room for bad luck in face-to-face. -face. And also, even though their hacking game can be aggressive and strong, uh, they don't have super good hackers, so if the enemy has a good killer hacker, they can easy, quite easily usually kill the Drew's hackers. Yeah, like we talked about earlier when I was pumping the tires of QK, there are other factions that get access to the pitcher play available to the truce that can then 
uh, take advantage of that with more powerful and, and more diverse uh, hacking network of their own. Uh, the Trues also have lackluster lieutenant options. You probably don't want to field uh, Arslan at all, period. And if you so for some reason choose to field him, you don't want to make him your lieutenant because that's an active piece and you don't have access to chain of command. And that then leaves you with the choice of either including a Trues lieutenant or a Brawler lieutenant. And since Brawlers are willpower 12 and Trues are willpower 13, the opponent will be able to um, <laughs> know who's your lieutenant from, from what willpower you're rolling on your lieutenant roll. And then that puts the pressure on you to include a decoy of some kind, either having two standard vanilla brawlers or two druses, so that the enemy doesn't know who the lieutenant is, or then you have to accept the risk that they know who the lieutenant is and they may be going for an assassination run on them. Yeah, definitely. So basically the only sensible option is to take a brawler lieutenant and then maybe have one list that has a decoy if you're playing against factions that can assass assassinate a lieutenant and then maybe have another list uh, with only one brawler lieutenant that you can hide well if the opponent's faction lacks those assassination opportunities. Then again Tao Wu can help here also. You may want to include him just for what he brings in and of himself and then you can mask him as the same type of unit that you're using for your lieutenant to help in that regard. Yeah, that is also true. Although I'm not quite convinced of Tao Wu yet, but I think I need to experiment with him a bit more. I have seen him in action only a couple of times. But so, I think Drews is definitely in the B tier, somewhere in the middle of the pack. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I can get behind that. I'd be inclined to place them a bit south of the middle of the pack just because uh, they lack depth. Uh, their pieces are good, but they you run out of those pieces at some point. So Yeah, maybe uh, close to Corregidor. Yeah, maybe between Corregidor and Starmada. Yeah, I'm happy with that. We're yeah, then we have... To... Yeah, to JSA. Uh, I'll let you take this one. You have much more experience on JSA. Okay, I, I've i been playing JSA for the past year on and off. Um, they are a truly intriguing faction. Uh, and the first thing that people say about JSA is that they have gorgeous models and, and that they are a beginner bait because of how cool they are, but also how difficult they are to play. Uh, I don't necessarily subscribe to that way of thinking wholly. Uh, they do have several characteristics and, and mechanics that make them play the game in a different way, uh, but that doesn't necessarily make them overly difficult. You just have to take their special abilities and make good use of them. They are a heavy infantry faction at their core. Um, Tangos are excellent and Domarus are just amazing. Um, the Domarus offer you uh, indirect attack vectors that are extremely difficult to defend against. <clears throat> First, pretty much all um, JSA heavy infantry units have stealth, if not all of them. So with the way stealth works these days, a fire team of samurai can advance forward, and even if one of them, the team leader, activates to to shoot, for example, or strike someone in melee, that doesn't break the stealth of the rest of the guys. So if you have, let's say, three, four, five samurai advancing on the enemy, even if you have to sacrifice the stealth from the leader to make an attack, the others are still uh, free to move forward without getting hacked. Uh, unless there's a sixth sense hacker involved. So in that way they can bypass some of the traditional counters to heavy infantry. Um, they dodge four inches and they are able to berserk eight inches after that. So you can effectively park your Domaru 
just outside of the zone of control of the enemy you are looking to engage, dodge with physic 14 into within 8 each inch line of fire and then berserk them. And there's absolutely nothing the enemy can do to stop you <coughs> if they were, unless they were able to see you on your on your uh, previous order. Um, also, they carry EM grenades that they can even speculatively attack with with 11s uh, within 8 inches. And with the way that template works when you use, uh, when you use in, um, speculative attack, is that you are able to actually affect models that are beyond 8 inches from you, which means that Domarus can speculative fire grenades at things like repeaters and remotes, carrying repeaters, so that they can clear the way for, for the rest of the uh, samurai to advance forward. So there's plenty of there to work with. Yeah, so you need to place the center of the template uh, within 8 inches if you want to have those uh, range band bonuses, but because you can measure your zone of control, you can put the center exactly uh, within eight inches, and then you, the template reaches about two inches from there. So you basically have a bit over ten inches of reach with your speculative grenades. Yeah, exactly. And if you are running several Domaros together, you can even do a coordinated attack by lobbing a bunch of EM grenades at people. So they, they are surprisingly good in that regard. Also, all the samurai, while they have low BTS, they have a high physique. And if you punch them in a core, they get sixth sense. So they are quite difficult to um, smart missile or guided missile to death also unless you punch them up real close to one another. While they lack tin pots, it's probably a good idea to bring an Evo hacker just for fairy dust, so that makes the whole whole group more difficult to hack. The traditional narrative is that JSA sucks at shooting, which I don't necessarily buy after playing them a bunch. Um, Dio guys can brute force their way through a lot of stuff with either a burst 5 Red Fury with BS 13 or 14, depending on what type of fire team you are putting them in. Um, or, or they can go after harder targets with the multi marksman rifle. Um, and also, I feel that the uh, Dio guy gives you almost tag level impact. Um, on your list building because they uh, have two wounds, five armor and no wound incapacitation and they are NCOs. So they're almost like a tack aware unit that you can put in a fire team and, and move the fire team around. So, uh, and, and Tankos, uh, the cheapest Tanko comes equipped with uh, Flamen Spear, which is basically in a fire team one use heavy rocket launcher. <clears throat> So when you staple that into a BS-13 or ARM-3 two-wound model, that becomes a decent ARO deterrent, and it's even something that you can use uh, as a fire and forget when advancing with the fire team. So I think the samurai really prop up the faction and, and make them, make them uh, better than their reputation is in that regard. Then on the negative side, I do feel that the ninjas are unfortunately overpriced uh, and underdeveloped for what they do. Um, JSA has a pretty lackluster access to smoke, so somebody like Saito Togan can really, really be important. Uh, and I have had some really good results with the Ninja Forward Observer, but I feel that Oni Vapans uh, and some of the other ninjas are. Uh, too expensive and too easy to counter with stuff like mines and template weapons for, for what they bring you. Also, JSA specialists are a bit lackluster. If you want to uh, bring a samurai specialist, we're talking about a 29-point uh, Domaru forward observer. Uh, and if you go ninjas, they're also expensive and there aren't that many types of, of specialists available to them. Uh, and Geisotsus are only willpower 12 and you have to make a dedicated effort to move them forward. Um, willpower 14, Genpei Tai, Chain of Command, 
uh, wildcard can help you here and aragotos are, are excellent uh, especially as specialists i really really like the aragoto killer hacker because you get a 20 point model that can cyber mask uh, then it can make a four four uh, uh, eight plus six inch move first move and enemy can do or like a move move and enemy can do anything except discover and then it can make a four inch uh, eight inch move again and then it gets to shoot something with a, a light shotgun so it's effectively impossible to stop uh, in, in that circumstance but other than that uh, some many JSA profiles feel a bit overpriced for what they do. Some something like uh, Karakuris, for example, are cool, but they are really expensive in a faction that just just wants to spam samurais. In many cases, it's hard to justify taking a Karakuri that costs the same as two samurai. Um, and oh, your Roy just got a killer new model, but it's also not that easy to include from a list building perspective. Yeah, I think one of the other weaknesses of JSA is the difficulty of list building uh, because of a lack of good cheerleaders. So you mentioned that many of the models are a bit overpriced. And in some factions, that's not too big of a problem. But in JSA, I feel that it is a big problem because you have uh, very limited access to cheap orders. Well, you have access to nine point Keisotsus, so that helps somewhat. But um, Keisotsus are not the ideal cheerleaders. No, if, if you, <laughs> no they are not. <laughs> if, if you compare to flash pull spots or Ikadrons or something that are actually also useful. Yeah, for sure. And or even cheaper. And the other issue I find with JSA is uh, regarding this specialist is that Usually you want to spend your orders on the Samurai or other heavy infantry models, or maybe Oyoro if you're taking it. But those are not specialists, so you have so if you are playing a mission where you need to press a lot of buttons, you need other other models to press the buttons and then other models to attack. And that uh, makes the whole like play pretty order intensive. Yes, very much so. And also the way that the samurai units tend to attack is also uh, very um, it reflects well on their backstory because um, when I attack with something like the super soldiers of Rama I usually get the guys I'm going after and then it's the enemy's problem to take out my super soldier once I'm done I'm able to put them in the in a spot where they're difficult to take out but with the way that the samurai Domarus especially tend to attack, they then tend to get hacked or killed as they perform their attacks on the enemy. Yes, they usually trade up, but they aren't going to be uh, that big of a problem to the enemy to deal with uh, at their turn. And once their turn starts, so they get to uh, do what they were doing without having to worry about the samurai at that point. So that's also a, a problem for JSA. Yeah, and if you start your first turn with uh, advancing uh, uh, with the five men samurai core team and then they are dead by the end of the opponent's first turn uh, you're going to lack orders in the rest of the game but Add hitting power yeah uh, but JSA doesn't really have like great alpha strike models that could reliably like do some damage on turn one and and not cost you a lot uh, I mean, Shinobu uh, can be great, but I feel that Shinobu is a bit unreliable, especially against opponents who know to expect Shinobu and can defend against it uh, with template weapons and mines and so on. For sure. There probably is some sweet spot there. Uh, I, I'm interested to um, try and innovate, uh, finding what's the right number of samurai to send forward on the first turn. Uh, how ma how many do you need to reserve for later, and how many is enough that you can perform a credible alpha strike on the first turn, if you can clear the way for them. But uh, that requires some some more uh, testing uh, at the moment. Yeah. So where would you place JSA? Somewhere in lower B tier, 
I guess. Yeah, or middle-ish beat here. Um, they do have have a whole lot of promise, and their bench of troops is um, at least on paper deeper than Drus's. Even though I uh, I a bit nihilistically once said to somebody that the right amount of ninjas in most JSA lists is zero, so that eliminates quite a lot of their bench. Uh, maybe between Drus and uh, Corregidor. I would say Corregidor is better and like more balanced faction than JSA, and like in some matchups and in some missions, JSA can be really strong. But I feel when we are looking at a five round or even a three round tournament, uh, JSA uh, does struggle a bit. Yeah, I can get behind that. So maybe somewhere close to Onyx. Well, I would place them above Svalar Hema for sure, because if if you're considering what you get with Svalar Hema um, over JSA, that's not that much, I feel. So, or maybe between Svalar Hema and Onyx, somewhere there. Okay. Yeah, I think that sounds pretty good. Okay, let's place them between those two. And then we move to Ikari Company. That is kind of like a sister faction to JSA. Uh, they have many of the same models. Uh, they share some of the strengths and also many of the same weaknesses. In general, I think Ikari uh, is really good in missions that don't need specialists. Uh, they can build really nice wound spam lists. They have access to a lot of cheap uh, two wound units like Tankos, uh, Booming, Armand. Diggers, but I think that's Diggers. more or less the end of the list. And I, if I'm playing the Devil's Advocate here, who would you rather have, Woomings or Domarus? Because that you don't get Domarus here, so... Um, in that yeah. regard, I, I I like JSA way more than I do Ikari. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think Woomings are at best mediocre. They can be okay, but Domarus are way better. What they have and JSA doesn't is uh, Desperados, for example. Uh, they also get Scarface, but I think Scarface and Oyoroi are quite similar in terms of yeah. like strength. A wash maybe in this regard yeah but i think in terms of like specialist play uh ikari struggles even more than jsa like they don't really have access to any advancing specialists they have aba1 uh, pathfinder uh they have ninjas but that's basically it. they have access to jews but they can only get a jews harris and you don't really want the jews fire team to like go up to the midfield and press buttons yeah you surely don't you really miss miss the aragotos uh, and the uh, kuroshi rider here and many of the units that um, or at least some of the units that um, ikari gets uh, that jsa doesn't are more flavorful than than good here when we take a look at something like alpha seeds for example they really don't fit into this this um, uh, list from from where I stand. Yeah, they're another two wound model that Ikari has enough, but they have better or cheaper two wound models than Alpha Seed. And Alpha Seed doesn't fire a team in this sectorial, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can get a duo with Alpha Seed. Probably not even that. No, it doesn't look like that. Yeah. Uh, one of the selling points of Ikari used to be that you could include a Tanko missile launcher in a case of Chulink, and you can still do that, but they are not a pure fire team anymore. And then the unique selling point of that starts to like, suffer. Because, well, BS-14 uh, missile launcher is still okay, but it's not that great. And I'm not sure if that's the like core fire team that you want to have, and whether you want to really have four case of Zeus in your list. Yeah, and I, I personally don't rate the Tango Missile Launcher in and of itself 
very highly because the selling point of getting tangos is that it's it is that they are uh, heavy infantry priced as light infantry and when you upgrade to the missile launcher you also in, uh, increase your points cost to to almost 30 points so you kind of lose lose what the tangos are in in my mind yeah that is also true so in in some matchups uh in some missions against some opponents, I think Ikari can be a really strong faction. But if you're playing a five-round tournament with Ikari, uh, you're probably not going to get consistent results. Because there are also many matchups and missions where they do struggle. And I think because of that, Ikari goes to C tier. Yeah, I would agree so. Maybe on top of C, but still. Uh, maybe I've placed them between military orders and is really that low okay yeah i can i can live with that yeah i think it's like they could be on top of c but because they really uh, struggle in missions where you need to press buttons or do other specialist stuff yeah yeah that's a fair point and that's quite a quite many of them and we're not even talking about stuff like countermeasures here or or anything more special yeah actually countermeasures might be better for them because you can complete classifieds uh without pressing buttons but when you need to have some something to go forward and press buttons uh you don't have many options and if your opponent can uh, target those uh, it's going to be difficult then we can move on to Star Company. You have played some Star Co, so I'll let you get started on this one. Yeah, yeah, I'm not that familiar with Star Co either, but I I have played with them and I have uh, done some list building with them. And my feeling about Star Co is that they can make a really solid upper B tier list, uh, but they can't really make more than one good list with the options they have and usually the list that i uh, build with starco starts with the riot curl fire team uh, but unlike bakunin i'm not even trying to build a pure uh, riot girl fire team because uh, i think it was avicenna who doesn't count as a riot girl in starco yeah, yeah and you don't really want uh, four riot girls and a fiddler but they have access to wildcard diggers. So usually I take two diggers uh, or, or one digger and then a couple of riot girls, obviously not a fiddler in a fire team. And usually because of that, I don't use the missile launcher in the fire team. Instead, just the Spitfire and the Tinbot uh, riot girls because having a BS-14 missile launcher is not nearly as uh, good of a threat as a BS-16 missile launcher. But on top of that, they have some like really nice other units like uh, Alhava, uh, Hard Cases. Uh, they have Knauf that can be linked with, for example, Alguazils. They have Irmandinhos, although only only ABA-1. And I think like one of the reasons why they can build only a very like limited types of good list is that they have lots of AVA-1 units, like both hard cases and al Hava are also AVA-1, and that limits the op like options that you have. Uh, one thing that I really like also is the Uha, who, who, who I think is uh, one of the best hackers in the game, uh, because it's the, it's 18-point uh, no-wound incapacitation whip 14 hacker with also BTS-3. So it's a very cost-effective hacker. Yeah, and you can put, get her behind Tinbot minus six in this faction yeah. pretty easily. Yeah, that's yeah, that's actually also one one model that I usually include in that uh, core fire team that I have. But then there are not that many other options that you actually have in in Starco. Yeah, it, it used to be that um, getting full core fire team bonuses with uh, Knauf or Emily Handelman was pretty terrifying but now that you are unable to achieve either in the case of um knauf in not under any yeah and emily also they they don't have any tags um, for any unit type so you will never get pure fire team bonuses with those guys 
so that that has impacted uh, the power of this faction if if not the <laughs> if not the list building diversity uh, in in a problematic way and also the starco does feel like your first generation mercenary faction in that the selection of troops it has available is uh, rather conservative when we uh, compare this to something like Dashat that we're going to talk about soon. Yeah, I think Starco used to be Emily, the faction, but now without the pure fire team access to Emily, uh, I don't find Emily that useful anymore. And I don't think now actually was linkable before, so I think that's actually new for them. Ah, okay. Uh, they also have a bit of a similar lieutenant problem as Corregidor, so they get Alguazil Lieutenant for one SWC. Although fortunately they also have access to Brawler Lieutenants, which <laughs> usually uh, is <laughs> Where no, do you no... that phrase? <laughs> yeah, it's nowhere near the best lieutenant option there is, but that gives you the opportunity to have a 15 point uh, zero SWC Lieutenant. Thank goodness for a 15 point willpower 12 plus 10 and few. Yeah, and I find that uh, I often have to take that brawler lieutenant because uh, otherwise I don't I don't have the SWCs to bring uh, the GML package and a couple of heavy weapons into my list with also some hacking. Also, like one kind of a cool thing that Starco can do, and I don't think if it's only a meme or if it can actually work. I haven't ever tried this, but they could have a Harris fire team with Anaconda, Trip Hammer, and Nidmer Dinho. Goodness gracious. Yeah, two and... mediocre tags, uh, but in a Harris they are a bit better, and then they have an engineer. The problem there is them. that the engineer really can't help the Anaconda, because once the Anaconda takes two wounds, it goes, uh, the pilot goes pop. But now that we're looking at that list, they could include a mobile brigada there. So how about Anaconda, Trip Hammer, and mobile brigada hacker with Tinbot minus six? Ah, oh. yeah, that actually could also work. You don't necessarily need the engineer if you have Tinbot minus six firewall there. Yeah, I have you to experiment with that plus, as well. Yeah, you get get the minus six and you get the um, BTS. Yeah, I yeah that that seems something that might be worth trying out. Yeah, and they do have access to some cheap models, so they can actually afford that kind of a ex expensive Harris team. Yeah, I need to experiment, experiment with that. It could be just a meme, but it could also work, at least in some matchups. Uh, but overall, I think Starco belongs in the B tier, definitely <clears throat> somewhere in the middle of B tier. And I would probably place them uh, between Corregidor and Svalarheima. Yeah, I'm, I can live with that. And then we go to Foreign Company. This is a faction that you uh, played and list built in a recent League of Hours. So how do you feel about them? Yeah, so I think the first episode I mentioned that we had a tournament where all experienced players had to pick C or D tier faction and foreign company, which I thought was a C tier faction, was my choice. And after uh, list building with them, uh, trying four different lists in four different games, uh, I do think foreign company is actually better than C tier for sure. Uh, they have a few really good options uh, in their lineup. Uh, they have good links so first of all they have bolts and i think foreign company is the faction where bolts are actually useful because you can build good links around them unlike in nca i think uh, the bolt links are not that good because you have to use mostly only bolts or then yeah, like a volatile yeah. that don't really synergize that well with bolts yeah, we're we're again on on the uh, military order syndrome part of <laughs> part of this tier list. That something that's technically home to some other sectorial is uh, actually better here than than in its home sectorial in a way. Yeah, and uh, they have really flexible links. So, and 
access to really good models that you can inc include in those things. So they have Valkyrie and Senor Massacre, who are both really good uh, close combat or close range uh, models. They have Laxmi, uh, who is a pretty good hacker. They have Avicenna, who is a great doctor. Uh, they can also include orcs there if you need more heavy weapons, although I prefer bolts. Also the orc tin bot uh, with boarding shotgun gives some robustness to those links and is great with uh, combining with Laxmi and giving uh, Laxmi that uh, tin bot. And usually you can like take maybe six or seven of those models that I just mentioned and then when the game begins you can decide what kind of links you want to build with them. So you can go with uh, one fire uh, five uh, person link or you could do like two, three person links or three and a four person link and then adjust them uh, during the game. Yeah, that's a pretty big strength uh, of a faction when you can do that because that allows you to tailor your approach to the table and the opponent and the scenario on the fly without having to prepare a specific list for that situation and, and that kind of um, fluidness in, in what you can do is, is extremely powerful in modern infinity. Yeah, uh, usually my preferred way is to take two bolt snipers in a list, um, maybe start them out in a different fire team. So, so there are like two great snipers at different parts of the table. And then uh, also if one of them dies, which can happen because bolts only have one wound, uh, if your opponent crits you or uh, makes like coordinated attack with a few puncher fouls, the bolt will go down, but then you have another bolt in reserve. And if you're able to take out your opponent's uh, big gun or guns, uh, you can really dominate the whole field with those bolts. Uh, on top of that, they also have uh, access to Uberfall Commando, which is a great uh, close assault piece. And if your opponent like null deploys because you have bolts, you can just run your Uberfall Commando into your opponent's deployment zone and take take out their most important model or models there. Uh, they have also have uh, access to quite aggressive repeater game because of the zero with deployable repeater. So if you want to attack your opponent that way, you also have that possibility. <clears throat> they have also peacemakers to give you some midfield presence and repeater presence there. Uh, they also... have Rockmen, which are possibly the best Pan-Oceanian skirmishers. They have access to a forward observer with deployable repeater profile, and they also have a hacker, Willpower 13 hacker profile available to them. Yeah, and the Krogman sniper isn't bad either, although I haven't really used Krogman that much because they start to cost quite a lot. If I need some midfield specialist, I usually prefer zeros just because of the price, because there are other models in the list that uh, need those points, but uh, uh, Krogman are still a very valid option for a foreign company. But I think their biggest weakness and and like although uh, these pieces that I mentioned can build a pretty good, flexible and coherent list, uh, their uh, biggest weakness is their overall lack of options. So you only, uh, so a bit like other uh, non aligned army factions, uh, also foreign company and maybe even more foreign company only has those few options that they can take. And that limits the list building in terms of uh, versatility and also in a way that you often like want to build a list for certain kinds of missions for a tournament uh, and you have maybe some amount of points left, but you don't really have anything useful for that amount of points. Then you have to think if you need to rebuild your list totally, or if you need to uh, take something that is actually not that useful, but just because you have uh, the points and slots left. So like really honing your lists is a bit difficult or can be a bit difficult with a foreign company. Yeah, you, you pretty much covered it right there. I don't really have anything to add to that. Uh, but based on that, I would place foreign company uh, also somewhere in the middle of B tier maybe 
uh, just behind Starco, but ahead of Swalar Heima. Yeah, that that feels like a neighborhood <clears throat> that many of these guys are are getting into. Yeah. And it's kind of funny to see foreign company ahead of so many pano sectorials when they are like half pano faction, but just the addition of access to smoke and or at least access to eclipse smoke and then the fact that they have good hacking game uh, I think puts them ahead of most of the pano sectorials. Yeah, for sure. And the fact that they are able to for more diverse fire teams with bolts gives them the main strength of, of uh, Pan O in that they're excellent at shooting and then you get all this stuff be beyond that. Yeah, yeah, I really like those foreign company fire teams. And although uh, they are not the most durable, many of the models have only one wound, but they are still pretty versatile with good shooting, uh, hacking, good short range shooting, uh, good CC your specialists. And somebody like Valkyria, Valkyria can really defend them quite efficiently at close range. It's really hard to attack them from, from where Val, uh, Valkyria is protecting them. So that makes, makes close assaulting them extremely difficult, especially when the bolt is able to see through smoke. So you can't even use smoke to get close that way. Was there something else I need to say about foreign company? Yeah, uh, I really want to highlight the like the great synergy between the fire teams and Uberfall commandos. So in many matchups, usually the opponent has some uh, good model that can challenge the bolts in in, in a firefight, something like a Tick Balang or some other like really dangerous model for you. Uh, but you can use the Uberfall commando to take that out first, and then you can dominate the game with your fire teams. Then next we have the Dashat company. The natural habitat of the Mar Magariba guard. Yeah, I think if you want to play Magariba, this is the faction where you can do it. Because Dashat has a good access to cheap but efficient models. And talking about cheap and efficient models, uh, they have AVA2 Libertos who also get Mimetism minus three. This is exactly the type of stuff that in my mind separates the first generation uh, and the subsequent generations of uh, mercenary factions. Uh, when you look at stuff like being uh, getting access to AVA2 Libertos with Mimetism and all the other great stuff that uh, Dashat gets, this, this is a list of models that is way more aggressively put together than some of the others we have already talked about. Yeah, I totally agree. And there are also like good synergies with the models that they have. So I really like the mind games that you can play with having two uh, Mimetism minus three Libertos and a Hunchaku and maybe even a Sencha. So you have Four you two. can really clock up the midfield and, yeah. and all those camos uh, are a bit different when it comes to how they are dangerous to you and how they can attack you and what you need to engage them with in order to effectively take them out. Yeah, exactly. So you could have four to six camos in, a mid in midfield and when one of those camos starts to advance towards you, uh, do you discover or not? If it's a Liberto, you want to discover and not let it get close, but if it's a Hunchaku, it can just forward observe you and then there's a missile coming. And also defensively, like if you want to leave those Libertos standing up, uh, you cannot distinguish between Liberto and a mine anymore or a Hunchaku and a mine. Yeah, exactly. And those are still uh, cheap enough pieces that while the Libertos eat up your SWC quite quickly. You can still include stuff like the set Magariba Guard. Um, use some excellent Gulam specialist and lieutenant profiles in order to get high willpower and, and the uh, moderate cost from, from those parts of your list. Uh, you get access to Kum Bikers, um, which are excellent uh, biker warp ants. Uh, you have McMurrow here. Um, Valeria makes an appearance. 
and you even if you f are so inclined you have access to uh, stuff like Zhu Yong, Invincibles and Hulang Shock Troopers uh, that can really give some some staying power and, and some brute force to uh, this faction. Yeah, and unlike many other non-aligned armies, uh, Dashad has pretty good lieutenant options or lieutenant option in the uh, Gulams, who are cheap willpower 14 models, and they also have the lieutenant plus one command token profile that is really useful in Dashad, where you are likely to include many irregular models. And in many factions, when you're list building, your foremost restrictor on what you can include is the amount of points. In some factions, is the amount of SWC. But in Dashat, it can easily become the amount of models uh, you have access to, or, or like the 50 model cap, because you are able to get so many great cheap pieces that you need to spend those points somewhere. So for example, paying those four points for that extra command token is way more viable here than it is, in, for example, in Rama Task Force. Yeah, and it's still useful in that shot. Uh, yeah, you mentioned cheap orders, so they also have access to AVA3 flash pull spots, although usually you're, you have filled up all your troop slots before you even get to the flash pull spots. They also, and of course- five point regular tractor mules, if you are really <laughs> for points. Yeah, and you also have access to the best uh, FO bot Rafik in the game, if you want that. And and I do like the link options that Dashat has. And uh, in similar way as other non online armies, uh, you don't really need to build a pure fire teams but you can still build an efficient and relatively cost-effective core fire team with them. Uh, for example, you can have a Suyong core with HMG and the Tinbot Suyongs, then put Valeria there behind the Tinbot minus six, and then have two diggers in the fire team as well. Or if yeah, you that's want... That's pretty terrifying and quite uh, uh, not that expensive either. Yeah, so there is burst five BS14 uh, HMG. Uh, the fire team has with uh, 14 hacker behind a team, but minus six. Uh, diggers are cheap and provide some like protection from anyone who is uh, coming close. And they might even roll something important or, or useful from uh, their booty rolls. Yeah. And you also have two extra orders for that fire team. Uh, then, if you want, you could also build a pure brawler digger fire team, although I think uh, Juice is more of a home for that kind of fire team, but that's, that's an option you have also in Dust Shot. And then you can also build some like nice supportive fire teams with Gulams, with the NCO Smoke Grenade Launcher, uh, Gulam Doctor, who uh, can benefit from the Harris fire team and fire uh, burst two medikits for those Suyongs, for example. You can maybe have the Gulam Lieutenant in the fire team if you need someone to fill it up, or you can take a Gulam Hacker there. So I, I think uh, Dashad is overall a pretty well-rounded uh, non-aligned army faction. Uh, they do have some weaknesses, though. Uh, they don't have any killer hackers, <clears throat> which isn't necessarily a big problem, but it can be a problem, or at least it's a limitation. Um, also, without Maggie, and they don't usually want to include Maggie in every list. And if you don't have Maggie, you don't really have any AP weapons in your list besides the missile bot, if you're taking it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and Maggie, in and of, of herself, um, is counterable. And, and when the enemy knows that your uh, AP prowess is coming from either missiles or Maggie. That's something that they can truly prepare for. Obviously, you can um, imitate the the um, power of of uh, AP weapons or AP ranged weapons with some close range solutions like Magmoro, for example. But that's uh, order uh, ineffective in many cases. Yeah, that's true. And yeah, lastly, they also have access to Fiddler. <clears throat> who is another great model and 
in many other factions you struggle to find the points for Fiddler, but in Dashad you usually do have the points to include Fiddler if you want <clears throat> to provide another good attack threat to the list. Although at some point uh, a Dashad list probably runs into, into a situation where it has so many order-hungry, offensive-minded models that it can't make the best use out of all of them or many of them. Uh, and while the fact that you have diversity and you have options is always good, uh, you do get diminishing rates of return at some point. So probably at some point you have to say, okay, now I have enough uh, models that want to go forward and engage uh, the enemy at close ranges, and now I need to include something else, even though I still haven't included these excellent offensive pieces that I could take. Yeah, that is a really good point, and that's like one weakness or downside that you have with Dashat, that you don't have any super good models that are happy to like spend all your orders. <clears throat> Instead, you have a lot of pretty good order hungry models, but you don't have orders for all of those. And then you might have to find some like less good or less optimal options that can do the same kind of task with less amount of orders, like maybe taking Sencha instead of Fiddler. But overall, I think uh, Dashat is one of the better non-allied army factions. So sure. definitely in B tier. Where would and you I'd place be willing Dashat? to put them close to the top or top part of B tier. Uh, better than Doha or Invincible Army. Yeah, I, I'd go as far. Maybe mm, up there with Old Wealth, maybe behind. I would be willing to place them between O12 and Toha. Yeah, that seems like a good home for them. Then finally, the last faction, White Company. This is something that neither of us, I think, have played all that much. But uh, it, it's some... Or have you played White Company? I used to play White Company quite a lot in the beginning of N4, but I haven't ah, really okay. played them for... Uh, two years, uh, but I have played against White Company uh, also quite a lot, and I think one friend of ours uh, put it quite well when he said that uh, White Company is what Pano should be like. Yeah, that's pretty well put. So they are more modern faction than Pano, obviously, uh, and they don't have those really. <clears throat> restricting limitations that Pano has. Uh, mostly they, they do have access to smoke and they have some like pretty decent hacking as well, which I feel uh, makes no sense that Pano doesn't have access to these things. Yeah, because what makes Pano, Pano, the excellent shooting is something that pretty much all the factions or most of the factions can replicate in one way or another reliably, but Pano can replicate the stuff like smoke, access to smoke in, in anything that it does. So, so that's, yeah, that's really a problem. Yeah, and at this point of the uh, evolution of the game and the uh, universal meta, uh, I feel that those limitations are really unnecessary for Pano. But if we go back into White Company, uh, they have pretty much it all. They have good shooting, like they have Karhus, they have Orcs, Jujak, Nisses, or Hideout Sniper. So a lot of different uh, pretty good options in terms of long range shooting. Uh, they also have good hacking uh, with Valeria and Danavas, and Valeria can also in white company go behind a minus 16 but if you want uh, they also have access to decent repeater game with their uh pano remotes and the uh, guilang uh, deep level repeater <clears throat> and guilangs are also really good specialists so uh, with the pathfinders and guilangs they have a pretty good specialist game uh they have decent warbands. I don't think Warangians are uh, great, but they are decent and they bring the smoke to the faction and some additional like protection. And I think this is something that like 
Pano should also have like, I mean, Pano doesn't have to be the warband faction, but having access to some Varangian guard-like model that is uh, still decent and doing the job, even though not the best or the most optimal profile in the game. Yeah, for sure, for <clears throat> sure. Uh, and, um, and, I saw, I saw. and the Pano also tends to have on the um, more restricted side when it comes to access to good uh, skirmishers and, and midfield presence. And here in White Company, you find something like the Beast Hunters at AVA2, for example, which is also pretty nice. Yeah, and they are also linkable in White Company if you want to do that. So, for example, you could have a uh, fire team with Karhu Fajarva, Karhu Paramedic, and a Beast Hunter FTO, which is quite nice. In general, I think the links in uh, White Company are pretty good. So, you could go with a Harris Fire Team with one big weapon, uh, either Orc, uh, Nisse, or Jujak. Then have the Jujak with Tinbot, and then a hacker, either Haida or Valeria. In the link, or you could go a full on pure core fire team with many different options, like uh, also Liang Kai, in addition to those other models. Yeah, you can really get a tasty fruit salad with this this faction. You can really uh, accommodate pretty much whatever tactical capabilities you want out of your core by including these different types of models that you get there, and uh, as we see here, um, diversity in, in modern world is, is the key when so many factions don't get access to good pure fire teams, the ones that are able to form uh, really excellent and diverse unpure fire teams are, are really really uh, good good factions in that regard. In, isn't, isn't it the saying something like on the island of the blind, the man with one eye is the king? Yeah, and also, as I mentioned before, they have access to good remotes as well. So they have pretty much like everything you need in a good faction. I would say the maybe the like only major weakness <clears throat> uh, in White Company, if you compare them to A and S tier factions, is that they don't have any overpowered or super good units. So in that sense, they are a bit like Vanilla O12. Uh, except that they are just a bit more flexible due to the presence of linked teams. Yeah, for sure. So how would we rate them then? Uh, I would rate them at the top of B tier ahead of UK. Yeah, I, I can get behind that. I could even put them at the bottom of A tier, but yeah, top of B is okay with me. Yeah, I think the like lack of super good models that all A tier factions have puts them, you know, just at the top of B tier. But, but then terms, again, it, they are way more diverse in what they can do, and they are more fast moving than Morats. So, so I do yeah, that think is that also they... true. I think they're very close to Morats, and we could even place Morats in the top of B tier as well. Should we go to the conclusions then? Now that we have placed every faction into our tier list. Yes, it, it seems we have we have uh, completed our labor of, of, of love here and, and now the list itself is complete. How does it look to you? Uh, it pretty much resembles the list that I was expecting us to make. Uh, I'm quite surprised that QK is uh, up there at the top of B tier, I would have not placed them there myself. Uh, I find a bit <laughs> hard to believe that it's there, but I can't really refute that either. So I, I let it stay there. And actually, now that I think of this, uh, maybe we, I could put more rats in the top of B tier because of their lack of versatility and their predictability. Yeah, I would be fine with that. Let's let's slot them a bit bit down. So yeah, do you find any other like injustices or incorrect decisions that we have made when you're looking at this list? Well, my main problem is with Vanilla Pan Oceania. I feel that um, 
we have consistently talked about the stuff that Pan O lacks and the stuff that it can't do, and still we have vanilla Pan O so high. So that's maybe my only problem at the moment. Yeah, I'd still be willing to place vanilla Pan O there because they're huge versatility uh, in terms of options that they have, and also they're good for team duos. Uh, they can, I think, overcome those limitations that Pano has, or to go around them. So I'd be, I'd be willing to put Pano there. Okay, then we'll leave it as is. Um, when you look at the list we have created, do you have any observations or, or um, thoughts that you want to put out there? Yeah, there are some uh, thoughts. So first of all, I think, well, it's clearly visible that most of the factions, probably about half of the factions are in B tier, uh, which I think is pretty nice. And I think those B tier factions are very close to each other. And in general, I think that like the bottom of A tier is close to the top, uh, top of uh, B tier. So there are not a huge difference in terms of power between the factions. Uh, but in B tier, you could take uh, like five factions that are next to each other. And it's really hard to say which one of those factions is the best and which one of those is the worst. Yeah, I, I really feel that when you make take a grouping like that, excluding the S tier uh, factions, you, you can really argue for them to be placed in, in another order also. And we come into a situation where the meta of a tournament or a local meta and the skill difference, even small skill differences between pe people, players, make the difference in, in what we can expect an outcome of a game or a tournament to be. And that's pretty great that game is at, at such a point. Yeah, and when I look at the B tier, even though the factions are really close to each other, but if I compare to uh, compare Morats and White Company to, let's say, NCA and uh, Caledonia, there starts to be a quite big difference. So in a way, yeah, I think sure. B tier could also be divided into kind of like upper and lower B tier. And like somewhere or somewhere close to a Contesimento, I think there is a bit of a like change that factions are starting to get worse compared to the upper B tier factions. Yeah, I totally agree. Maybe somewhere, for example, between Star Mada and Rus, but yeah, there is a dropped mark off there uh, where, where factions become uh, weaker for sure. But let's say a faction um, from Star Mada up wins a tournament, neither of us is going to be surprised by that, right? Yeah, I think it's definitely possible to win a tournament with any of the B tier factions. Maybe I would be slightly surprised if a player wins the tournament with NCA or Caledonia. And like, of course, you can win a tournament with C or even D tier factions. But when I look at the C tier factions, uh, if you're not by far the best player in a tournament, uh, it's going to be difficult to win with a C tier faction. Yeah, and I but, for sure want to see the lists of, of the player who wins with something like, let's say, US Ariadna. Yeah, and probably also the list of their opponents. Yeah, yeah, that too. Because Another observation <laughs> that I made looking at this is the fact that the vanilla factions tend to be rated quite high. So we have two vanilla factions at the in the S tier, and then we have three, four in the A tier, and none in D or C tiers. So yeah, only two a, in B tier. Yeah. Yeah, I think the overall consensus has been, especially after the fire team update, that vanilla factions are currently better than the sectorials. It's nice to see a couple of sectorials also in A tier, but I do agree with the overall view that vanilla factions are currently better on average than B tier factions. It'll be really interesting to see how the reinforcement mechanic affects the meta and, and this. I would imagine that this isn't something that has gone unnoticed by the CB, and I would imagine that part of the reason behind the whole reinforcements thing is that they are looking to to improve the sectorials when compared to the vanilla factions. The fact that we are starting to see um, units and profiles 
in, in larger numbers that are only accessible in sectorials um, also I think signals that CB is aware of the situation. Yeah I'm like cautiously optimistic about that and I, and I do think some small adjustments are necessary if they want to keep the game balanced. Also one other thing that I was thinking about is that when you're looking at this tier list and maybe you're playing with a low B tier or C tier faction against an upper B tier faction, it doesn't mean that the upper B tier faction is uh, more likely to win necessarily or has necessarily the edge against the lower uh, faction because Infinity has a small amount of rock, paper, scissors dynamic. So certain type of factions are better against some factions than others and better in certain missions than others or certain kind of tables, which I think also makes the game interesting. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I totally agree agree with that. So there are like some upper B tier factions who can really struggle against Caledonia or Shaswasti, for example. And some missions that are difficult for some factions that are maybe rated higher than a lower rated uh, companion of theirs on this list. Yeah. And like, of course, the best example is probably Toha, that even though Ariad nice that is at the uh, top of A tier, uh, they are probably, or they probably don't have an edge against Toha when they're playing against each other. Uh, Although it depends on the mission, of course, but Doha can really struggle against some C tier factions if they are playing a mission that doesn't suit Doha well. Yeah, or Tunguska, for example, can really run them off the table if they are able to leverage their hacking superiority in something in some missions, for example, even though Tunguska is close to the bottom of B. Yeah, and Tunguska is, in other ways, also a great example that because of their great hacking, uh, they can really like make the game difficult for many top of B tier or even A tier factions if they get to go first and have a bit of good luck also in their spotlight roles, for example. Also, one thing that I'm still not sure about is the placement of Star Mada. I thought the Star Mada is not as great as the middle of B tier, but I think I need to like play with and play against Star Mada a bit more. Yeah, the jury is probably still out on that one. So, but I would imagine we are going to visit this subject at some point after the reinforcements uh, rules have come out. So that'll be our next chance to place them someplace else. Yeah, I believe that we will do some kind of a faction analysis or tier list video after the reinforcements rule rules have been out uh, for a little while. Uh, we have had time to study those rules and how they affect the game. Uh, sure. One one last note that I have of the list that we have created here is the fact that while it does have many similarities to how many others have set up their tier lists or how the factions are talked about, I'm also uh, happy that we didn't follow in every case the the uh, faction narrative that is mainly out there and we put some factions higher let's say for example QK higher than some others might have put them and some uh, factions lower like for example Doha yeah so you everybody at home stay critical uh, let us know where we went wrong and and challenge our our conception of of how the situation is and uh, also that of of how others see the current meta of the game. And also, if you want to know more or hear more explanations why we have thought some faction is somewhere or why we haven't talked about a certain unit and so on, let us know in the comments. And maybe last comment from me uh, about the tier list and overall state of the game. I think that there is bit of a distinction between the S tier, A tier and B tier factions. And I've noticed that many good players, especially in satellite tournaments and other like bigger tournaments are currently playing A or S tier factions. And I think uh, that's probably not 
the like best thing for the game that many good players feel the pressure that they need to play a faction that is even though maybe not by much but still clearly better than most of the factions in the game if they want to have a good chance of winning tournaments yeah i can i can uh, get behind that thought uh, from a competitive standpoint sure and although infinity is quite well balanced game at least what i've heard uh, compared to many other war games in the like past few years the a tier and s tier factions i think have gotten even better compared to other factions that are b c or d tier and i yeah, i i, I, I didn't really feel frustrating for for you when you're trying to improve at the game and become the best best you can be and then when you you uh, run into a situation where even when you objectively dissect what happened and you go i i played right i played better than the other guy but they were able to to beat me uh, because this and that and the and the end result was that their units were just that much stronger not not a bit stronger enough stronger that even though you outplayed them you were unable to to get uh, get the victory and that's really not the place where you want to be at yeah so i do hope the reinforcement rules will balance the game a bit but we'll wait for the reinforcement rules and let's see what they do to the game yeah i'm really excited to see where infinity goes next yeah uh so Grotip, thanks a lot for doing this with me uh this took a few hours but i think it was worth it uh i hope listeners also feel that it was worth it worth their time to go through all this yeah, thank you panda for inviting me this was this was a nice experience i think we have also learned something and thanks for everybody for listening and let's hope we can do this again and be even better at this the next time around. Yeah, and thanks all for your comments so far. See you next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.